I could give you a huge long backstory on this one and prep you for all the wild twists and turns that are to come. But I'm kind of selfish and I'd rather sit back and watch your reactions as they unfold. Because this one is wilder than anything I have ever seen before in my life. And I have seen some ish. So, grab your popcorn, buckle up. This one's a doozy. We start with hearing number one on March 30th, 2023. Mr. Claiborne has been ejected from the marital residence for several weeks after a domestic violence incident. His attorney has filed a petition to restore his access to the marital residence. Mrs. Childress is fighting that. Mr. Allen uh, Baker, I did speak with him downstairs this morning when the case was going on and advised Mr. Hawley that um, he was requesting a continuance yesterday. Um, and I believe Mr. Uh, Baker had a DUI case downstairs during the same time. Um, he asked me to request a continuance because he couldn't be here. Um, he was just the, um, I've reached out to four other different lawyers offices, including legal aid in the last two weeks to cover all of these motions that have been served on me. Um, Amy Sawyer was a domestic advocate, legal aid, Miss Robert, who was her earlier, Miss Duke and Mr. Baker yesterday. And Mr. Baker took the case yesterday, and I had my friends drop off the documentation. Well, Mr. Baker has advised our clerk that he has not been retained to represent you, and therefore, um, the fact that you've not been, you've not hired an attorney, according to what you're telling me and what Mr. Baker tells me, um, this uh, was here today because on the March 23rd of this year, which is one week ago, a motion for a restraining order was here, was filed. And based upon the allegations set forth in that restraint motion, <clears throat> the court issued a temporary restraining order that can only remain in effect for a set period of time. And I set it for a hearing for today on the 30th day of March. You have the right to have an attorney because number one, it involves the possession or uh, use of the marital residence. Number two, uh, it involves the question of whether or not uh, the restraining order should or should not be continued in force. Pardon me. And as a result of that, I am uh, trying to determine whether or not you're requesting for, you're asking for a continuance for you to hire a lawyer. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes, Your Honor. I spoke with Mr. Baker downstairs when we recessed. I went to his office um, when I spoke to him yesterday afternoon, um, like I said, his documentation was dropped off and I was going over there this afternoon to officially retain him. Mr. Holly, she's asking for time to hire an attorney and she's uh, essentially, this has been less than a week since this, or exactly one week since this order was entered. And I think she was served on the 23rd day of March, so she's only had one week. Do you have any opposition to rescheduling this with the order remaining in full force and effect? I address the court. You may. Well, we're here today for the possession. This I know the Mr. court. Shelton, uh, Mr. Claiborne. Mr. Claiborne, yes. Claiborne, come up. This is the table, if you will. Um, well, Judge, here's the, uh, here's the biggest issue of the, of the situation. There is also an order of protection. Let you know what we're here for. There's an order of protection that she filed downstairs in general sessions. It got served, uh, it got filed, and it got signed as the next parte order of protection. We were in court uh, Tuesday, and Judge Monsu moved the order of protection hearing uh, to Chantry Court. It was set for the, like the 4th of April, and I had a motion to continue, but I was busy that day or to move it to Chantry Court, and he moved it to Chantry Court, and I don't know if you have the file yet. I, there's well, still just been handed, all that, so. I've just been handed a document that uh, apparently was filed yesterday afternoon, a copy of the order that transferred the order of protection to the I wanted to explain real quick, because this was a little confusing to me. 
Tennessee's courts are named a little weird. The lower court is called the General Sessions Court. Then above that, you have the Chancery Court. So this is the equivalent to, say, Michigan's um, District Court. The General Sessions Court would be like Judge Simpson in the District Court. And then when it gets elevated up to the Circuit Court, where, say, Judge Conlin is, then that would be the Chancery Court. So Judge Wolf is in the Chancery Court, and they had the original order for protection heard in the General Sessions Court and whatever else happened previous to that was all in the General Sessions Court. So this is the first hearing in the Chancery Court. This court, yes, and we heard that on Tuesday afternoon, but that's the other, and I bring that up because that's the other time sensitive, uh, you know, hearing that, that the court has to have in addition to that restraining order. I know the courts have to give her a continuance for an attorney the general rule. The problem is with Mr. Claiborne, uh, this is a five month marriage. They've lived at that home since December only. Uh, and this home he has lived in for years. It is in, was in his and his deceased wife's name. I've got the deed. Uh, the court wants to see it. This is solely his property. He has a business that he operates out of uh, more or less the basement for warehousing purposes of repairing forklifts. I've learned about forklifts in this case. Apparently uh, from COVID and some of the manufacturing problems that we've had, there's like cars, no new forklifts on the uh, warehouse floor to sell and everybody wants their forklift repaired. He does quite the business. Um, this is a situation where with this house also, I have coming to court to testify, she's, she's here today, is a neighbor that's going to testify there are parties going on. I have photographs, I have video, I have a lot of unsultry things apparently going on over at that house on a more or less at least every other afternoon basis of a lot of cars in the driveway, a lot of cars coming and going at all hours of the night, people jumping in and out of the hot tub. It's kind of ridiculous the way the house is being treated, and that will be the evidence before the court. What I'm asking for, and I know the courts have to continue it, but what we're asking for is, uh, and it is his property only, to have some sort of access to this house on a daily basis during the day. He'll go somewhere and, and spend the night till we can come back to court, but we're asking for some sort of like 7 a.m. to 4 or 5 p.m. access to his own property at this point so that he can go down to the basement, pick out the air filters, the fuel filters, all of the oil, all of the things that he needs for his day and the, and the parts that are over there and have access to this house on pretty much a random daily basis. So he can come in there and do that. Um, and, and she has every available means to go somewhere during the day and she can come back and stay at night. We're also asking that there be no one over at this house other than the two parties. You know, there's no reason for anybody else to be at that house other than the two parties. There's nobody else that, that lives or resides anywhere um, uh, in that house or with them at this time. So if there's some sort of restriction here that says that, you know, those two will live there, or excuse me, that she will stay there at night, you know, without anybody else being there, uh, and he's allowed to kind of come and go during the day, we can set up some hopefully time parameters here where you know, this will work out until we can come back to court. With the order of protection and the restraining order, I think we have to be back probably before that second week in April if I'm looking at uh, my well, toes and fingers. Are available on April the 4th? That's Tuesday. I, I've got a full all-day uh, uh, juvenile court custody in Hickman County on that day. I think about every other day I'm, I'm around. I can look at my calendar. I think in all fairness, uh, to have some sort of parameters around this house in the meantime, uh, and that there'd be no... Uh, well, the problem is that we're dealing with both your motions in a divorce case where she has requested the opportunity to hire an attorney and the, order, and the restraining order that's just been filed on her and served on her one week ago in fairness to her, the, the need for an attorney applies to all of those things. It, I understand. She has a right to an attorney, and because it was not, uh, it has been a very short period of time, <clears throat> my uh, my inclination would be to grant her a request for an attorney for a continuance to grant her that opportunity to hire an attorney. The question then becomes, 
course, obviously, once I continue this hearing, there's been an ex parte restraining order that's been entered, and it will continue until there is a hearing. Um, the order of protection has just been transferred up. It's a temporary order of protection. Um, and therefore, it's going to have to have some sort of a hearing on that part, if nothing else, in the near future. And there is also, Judge, a domestic that we were over in White Bluff on Tuesday for about three hours. I can tell you this, too, for the court's edification, they agreed and signed an order. May I approach? Go ahead. That you the domestic bond conditions would be modified to follow the orders of Chancery Court, and that's signed by Judge Smithson. So I think I've got everything available to the court now with the order of protections transferred up, the bond conditions are in front of the court, so the court can make these type of decisions regarding the marital residence on a temporary basis, whether it's today or later, you know, anything like that. You're in control of the whole thing at this point, I guess, is, is what, I'm, what I'm telling the court. Not necessarily me, one of the judges on this level. Do you have a judge here Anytime in the near future. We have one in April, and uh, Mallory said that there, all her docket was full for April, but you'll have to get with her to get the one of them. This is who? Well, at least, uh, which I can, but the order of protection has a time frame that, of course, Ms. Childress has signed. My restraining order has a time frame that, you know, we worked on, so we've got some. Um, Oh, there's just some time limits on these things. That point, I wouldn't mind continuing it out and, and transferring my time frame, but I would need to have something with this house so because it's costing him a lot of money with this forklift thing. You know, I mean, so many days, I can't give you a day that doesn't exist. That's my problem. <clears throat> There's an out-of-county experience that we could have here. I'll be glad. I mean, I'll do anything. Do There's an out-of-county experience that we can. Well, I'll do would, anything. She would have to agree to it to be out-of-county. It's here. Um, Mr. Holly, let her have the podium, yes. please. Your Honor, I would like to state that, yes, we did have court um, on the domestic. I was with uh, the DA as well as Detective Lovell that day. And if I recall, I was on the stand until after 1 o'clock, and then afterwards I had to speak with investigators as well as um, Ms. Brooke Allen. So that is that that is what was tying me up on Tuesday. Um, as regard in regards to having access to the house, um, even Mr. Holly himself mentioned it. There's people taking pictures of my house. There's my every move is being documented. Um, there's also a police officer with the city of White Bluff that was involved that was terminated. And I'm requesting that absolutely not he not have any access to the property at this time i i do have individuals staying at the house one is uh, mr colin dever behind me and there's been no parties um and i would be a little alarmed as to how everyone knows my every move again <laughs> um and when in regards to his forklift business, he does his forklift repair business out of his van, which he has in his custody. And I reached out to Mr. Holly's office. I've already boxed up all the oil filters, air filters, everything that I know that he uses on a daily basis because even though we were only married since October 3rd, um, I would like to point out that I've been involved with him for almost two years or a year and a half. So. I'm fully aware of what he needs on a daily basis as I assisted him with his business and all of that. If that's what this comes down to is he needs to access those oil filters and oil. If you, if the city of White Bluff is, is not, it's my understanding they cannot be involved at this time. Detective Lovell has been assigned to the case representing the county through um, Mr. Crouch. I have no problem setting up a civil standby and allowing him to pick up those items um, that are boxed up that are his that is his work equipment however i do request due to the confrontation that's always taken place at the house with law enforcement there i do request additional officers be there and i request that i not be there and i will leave the items in a in a specific place um, you, can you address the court yes i mean again our 
when we get ready to do this, the evidence will show there's several pictures of parties going on, and this does not like, look like Mr. Deaver's jumping in and out of the hot tub and doing these sorts of things. There's a lot going on. Uh, we just got some time frames to hit. We just need a date as quick as we can possibly get. Yes, I can do is tell you that, that uh, I, can't, I can offer you the 4th of, of April, which is the only day I have available. The rest of my month of April is all committed to criminal matters in Humphreys County, Tennessee, First degree murder case that's set starting on the 11th, I believe. Is that right, Ms. McKinney? And, and every other day I've, I've obligated myself, I don't have any other days to give you. <clears throat> Especially so if it's going to take several hours to, to litigate. And obviously, this is. So they have the 25th, 26th, and 27th, is that right? For Judge Wallace. My best advice would be to, I'm going to have to continue it to allow her to have an opportunity. The only thing that was before me was the motion for possession of the marital residence and restraining order, mm -hmm. and those will both be continued until a hearing that can be set before Judge Wallace on one of those three days. So you just need to get with Judge Wallace and find out which day is the best day and set it on that day, and that gives Miss. Uh, Childress the opportunity to hire an attorney and opportunity to prepare for a hearing. Judge, in the meantime, though, is there any, any relief we can have on the house as far as any kind of access or any kind of restrictions on people going over there where he can just have some access during the day to get his stuff? Well, the access that you're, I'm going to have to have a hearing if, you're, if that's the case because she opposes that and, and that means it's got to be heard. So you're going to have to have her opportunity to hire an attorney Obviously, if she's being unreasonable about that, then that's something a judge will take into consideration. If she is not allowing access for no other reason, but there's an order of protection down um, in this case, so we have to be a little bit careful. So, Mr. Holly, all I can tell you is, is that if I grant her a motion to continue it, then everything's going to have to be continued. I can't do it piecemeal. And I think that, that under, unfortunately, she's going to have to understand that if she denies access to this property for unreasonable you know, reasons, then you can talk to her about whether or not she'd be willing to agree to some sort of method whereby he can gain access, but she's just stated she's not going to agree to it. So I think under the circumstances, the best I can tell you is that I have to give her an opportunity to retain counsel. I don't have another date to give you other than Tuesday the 4th. You change your other case and you want to have it heard on the 4th, and I'll entertain it on the 4th. Beyond that, I can't help you. So. Yes, sir. And well, I can tell you that you'll have to go to Judge Wallace on the 25th or 26th or 27th. What do we do then with the, the order of protection and the uh, restraining order? Order of protections are supposed to be heard uh, or they expire. The restraining order expires after it remains in full force effect for 15 days from the date of issuance. So it will stay in effect until uh, that hearing on the 4th unless you have to continue it beyond that day. As does the order of protection, it expires in 15 days, I think, unless it's heard, correct? I can extend the uh, order of the restraining order that I have until the next hearing. And that's the one I issued. I have nothing to do with the order of protection thus far. I mean, just to clarity, because I'm going to get asked this 100 times down the hallway, the order of protection then, as far as this court's concern, would dissolve if we don't have it timely heard within 15 days, I think it is. And then the restraining I'm order. I'm not making a declaratory judgment about that issue. I'm simply observing that I am not, this just was handed to me a few minutes ago. I'm not even aware that it had been brought or transferred to this court, but apparently the order transferring it was yesterday. So <clears throat> as of this court's, you know, situation, the order of protection uh, is by the statute, whatever it is. And I, we don't have judges that can sit day in and day out, as you well know. And as a result of that, we only have cases in which uh, we only have judges who can, can deal with it in some other fashion. Now, I can only tell you that I will give you the 4th to have a hearing, or you're going to have to go to the 25th, 26th, or 27th with Judge Wallace. You'll have to get that cleared with him. May we, uh, may we set it on the 4th, like in the afternoon? I don't know what the court's docket looks like on that day, but if we could do it at 1 with the thought that if... If I get my hands tied over in Hickman County, you know, I may have to call or do whatever. I'll try my I have best. a half-day hearing 
uh, already scheduled that day. So, and that's you would be after, you would be after that. So that would give you an opportunity to go to to go if that's what you need to do. So. If you want it set for the fourth, I'll give you the fourth. But the fourth, maybe at one o'clock, is that appropriate? I'll set it for fourth, uh, April fourth at one o'clock. And then if I can't make it, it might not be held against me too bad, or you're not going to send the police after me. I, I, I think that fourth thing, you know, they settle, so maybe it will settle. But uh, I'll try every way to work it back over here at, at one o'clock. That's appropriate. If not, then maybe we can pick one dates later in April. I'll reset this for April fourth to allow Miss Childress the opportunity to hire an attorney. April fourth. That's just okay. Tuesday at one uh, one thirty. Will be when it will be heard. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you, Judge. I appreciate your time. All Thank orders you. remain in full force and effect until that time. Yes, sir. Thank you. We're back for hearing number two, which is the same. Motion is hearing number one. And what we have here today is a motion for a temporary possession of the marital residence. I decided I wish to make a uh, statement judge if we can i would like to do a quick announcement on that restraining order make sure we're all good with it and then we'll uh move on from there i am going to request the rule please of course the rule has been requested if there are any witnesses in this case they must go outside of the courtroom and remain outside of the courtroom until you're called to testify do not discuss the testimony of any other party until you have testified yourself Council are on the continuing duty to ensure that rule is complied with. Mr. Woodall, Mr. Uh, what's the other one? Odell. Mr. Odell, Mr. Woodall, you have the case after this, and if we do not get to it today, you will. You can have it heard if you want. Thursday, here in uh, Dixon Chancery, we have the Marcello versus Marcello that you're involved in. So we can have, have moved this case to Thursday morning as well. Thursday morning will work for me, Doctor. All right. We'll hear it first, your motion first, and then we'll hear the Marcello case thereafter because this is set before the Marcello. So you're welcome to wait around. I'm just simply telling you that if you need to go, that's when I'll, that's what will happen. If you know Mr. Holly and Mr. Becker well enough that at 3.30 in the afternoon, if you think they're going to get to it before 5 o'clock, then wait around. <clears throat> Mr. Holly, you can announce your agreement. The agreement for the restraining order will be as follows. Now, it'll take me a minute. I just came out with it out in the hall. But basically, the, the restraining order is going to be agreed to with both parties participating in the agreement such that both parties... Uh, will be restrained from accessing any and all emails, social media, or any other accounts, financial or otherwise, bearing the name of Kimberly Claiborne, CNK Forklift, Christopher Wayne Claiborne, or Amy Childers. Or if there's anybody else we need to throw in there, I'll be glad to think, you know, we'll talk about it. Basically, the parties at that point. Um, the, the parties are restrained from having any involvement and or contact with um, any of the accounts, it's pretty much the same thing, including but not limited to their LinkedIn accounts or Facebook, banking, credit cards, or any other accounts dealing with the business um, of the husband, namely CNK Forklift. And I guess that's other than Mr. Uh, Mr. Claiborne has to have access to that because that is his business. That would more or less fall under number one, I guess, at that point. Uh, however, that works itself out. She has a, so I understand that there's a LinkedIn account and somehow or another she got, it got to shown up on there as she was the owner. And I think he's got one and maybe she's got one and that's how it kind of happened. But I'm assuming she would agree to take, if it's not up to him, she's going to agree to take that down where she's the owner. She, I don't know that she's the owner. I don't know that she's the control of that account. Of the Lincoln account, I didn't know if she had one. He thought that she I had. I have one. my own for the company. That the one that got 
the one that's got messed up is, is, is not mine. I still have mine for the business. Yeah. Um, both parties are going to be enjoined from making uh, uh, Amy Childress the owner of the Lincoln account, and both parties, I guess, would be restrained from not cooperating with each other while we try to resolve that one account that says maybe she is the owner, and you see that in attached to the motion. So that's the one thing that we need to be doing. Is that fair enough? That's fair. Um, and I understand that, um, according to Ms. Childers, she doesn't have any information with any of the passwords that were changed to the email address of his um, late wife, Kim Claiborne, 1973, gmail.com, or any of the other things that are listed here. Uh, but both parties would be court ordered to give up any passwords, if they've changed any passwords on any accounts of the other, both parties would be ordered to give the passwords to the lawyers and we'll pass it on to our respective clients. And the other thing is, uh, you know, he's got, and we've contested this, it's going to be very contested domestic with the bond conditions. There's that order of protection that, that the court saw that came in. Um, and my client was worried, and I think with good concern, and it would actually be reflective on both parties that if we try to get back in Kimberly Claiborne's email, which by the way is used for the business some, the, the, she was big with the CNK forklift with, with uh, Mr. Claiborne, and that was the name, Chris and Kim forklift, and uh, the client still use her email quite a bit, so he needs to get back into that thing, and he'll work to get back in or hire somebody to get back in. But when we do this, my understanding is, and I'm somewhat familiar, of course, I'm stuck in the 1980s when it comes to electronics. Um, I did get to get close to Jelly Roll at the Tides game, so I do know who that is a little before you did. But the Kimberly uh, Claiborne thing, if we try to get back into that account, it may very well, if there is some reflection with that email that we saw, it might ding her phone. She might get some sort of acknowledgement that we're going through some verification to change Kimberly Claiborne back, uh, you know, where Mr. Uh, Claiborne can have access to it. But if we have a Google notification or we have any other notifications that ding the phone of the other one, that will not count as a violation of anything, albeit the domestic bond conditions, which this court has, uh, the, the court and White Bluff City Court agreed that you have full reign to change those, whatever you want to do, and I passed that order up prior. Uh, but whatever it is, if somebody gets some sort of notification that we're changing these back, uh, it's not going to violate that or the order of protection. So um, if if I missed anything, let me know, Mr. Baker, but I think that covers it. And I'll do an order accordingly. And uh, let's take a short recess. Let me stretch my leg for a second. Yes, sir. All rise. This court is in recess. All right. If you wish to make an opening statement, Mr. Holly, go ahead. Well, Judge, briefly, just to give you a little roadmap, this is a five-month marriage. Married in October. They moved into this house in December. Um, they haven't been there long at all. There's a domestic. There's an order of protection. There's everything that could possibly be done has been done, I think. Uh, it's been highly contested. From Mr. Claiborne, uh, and it will continue to be highly contested that he ever committed a domestic assault, that there ever was a valid, valid order of protection that needed to be uh, needed to be done. What you're going to hear from from us today is that he's had this house since 2016 with <coughs> his prior wife. Prior wife passed away of in the horrible situation with COVID. Uh, he was on one floor of the hospital, she was on the other, and uh, it, it was it was horrible. But anyway, <coughs> he's passed away, and uh, of course the house is is, is uh, and continues to be uh, his his sole separate property. Um, the marriage has taken a, <coughs> a horrible turn for the worst, and uh, these these parties are are in a situation where they can't agree to much. The neighbors are going to testify about all the ongoings at the house. I think there's significant waste that this court needs to hear about a little bit in this situation. Uh, I think the evidence when it, uh, the dust settles, you'll see that uh, the wife does have some sufficient funds to get a place and to move on. I really think, uh, you know, we get into these and we know that short-term marriage is only one or two things that apply. But I think the biggest issue in this is possession of the house out of the whole marriage. So 
Um, we're asking the court to hear that today. Um, he, he wants his house back. He's been living in hotels. So that's what the court's going to hear. And uh, he runs the business out of his house. And it's instrumental for, for that aspect. He stores and keeps uh, forklift parts again. And I've learned a lot about how that works. Everybody nowadays with the way the, the world turns, they're not making new forklifts like they were making new cars. And everybody wants to keep their forklifts running. And he's got uh, quite a business being on call and things like that to keep everything going. And it's totally disrupted all. So that's that's our Thank you for making open. I'd wave, Judge. Can you call your first witness? Call Jerry Johnson. She's out in the hallway. Can we get it? You got it. Let me get it. You got it. State your name, please, for the record. Jerry Johnson. Ms. Johnson, where do you live? I live at 5276 Highway 70 East in White Bluff, Tennessee. In correlation to Mr. Claiborne's home, where where is that? Right next door. Okay, so um, you are familiar with Mr. Claiborne? Yes. How long have you lived there? I moved in February 1st, 2021. How do you find Mr. Claiborne since that time as your next door neighbor? Great neighbor, always looking out for each other. When he would leave town, he'd let me know, you know, various cars were going to be there, keep an eye on the house and vice versa. Okay. Share it, the same lawn guy. I'm sorry? We share the same lawn guy. Okay. Um, now, you're, you're aware that Mr. Claiborne has been removed from the home, correct? That was brought to my attention on the 6th of March. Okay. And what is it like living next to Miss Childress at this point? Uh, various cars in and out, different cars, probably a new car every other day, um, but multiple cars there. And with these multiple cars, they're going in and out. Uh, when are they going in and out? All times of the day and night. Have you noticed uh, unusual people over at the house? Yeah, some familiar and some unusual. <clears throat> How often do you see people over at the house? I would say there's people over there at least on a daily basis. You seen any of the same people? Yes, some of the same people. I want to approach. Come on. Come on. Put your picture and ask you if you recognize this picture. We got a few pictures to get through. Yes, do you I recognize do. That? What is that a picture of? A few people in the backyard in the hot tub. And uh, you remember when that picture was taken? Not the date exactly, no. Was it taken during the time that Miss Childress was over? Yes. May I approach you, Angel? You may. Yeah. Let me show you another picture and ask you to set that down. Ask you if you recognize that picture. Yes, I do. And again, was that picture taken during the time that Miss Childress was over there? Yes. So, what is that a picture of? Can you describe that to the court? Two ladies getting in the hot tub. Okay. Judge, I'm going to object to the relevance of this unless this is going somewhere. Huh? Judge? Oh, I've been hearing cases involving a lot of irrelevant things today, but I'm going to allow it over my objection. Are you wishing to make these an exhibit collectively? Collectively in a minute, Judge, yes. I mean, we don't have to do it. Time I approach. Okay. Show you another picture and ask you if you recognize that picture. Yes, I do. What is that a picture of? People outside on the deck. And was that picture taken uh, when Miss Childers was over at the home? Yes. 
And it was taken then during the month of March? Yes. Okay. It just Are all these pictures a fair and accurate depiction of what you see over at the house? Yes. I notice there are blinds here that are in the picture. Whose blinds are those? Those are my kitchen blinds. Okay. And you're taking these pictures from your kitchen, correct? There's some from my kitchen and then uh, to get pictures of the cars in the driveway, I take them from my bedroom or my daughter's bedroom window. Did you feel like there was some questionable activity going on over the house? Well, I noticed that things had changed considerably after uh, Chris Children or Claiborne, sorry, uh, was removed from the home. Did you see this type of activity going on when Mr. Claiborne had the home? No. Collective one, Judge. Collective exhibit one. Parking A, B, C, D, E, F. May I approach again, Jeff? Show you. Might help if I show you. and ask you if you recognize those photographs. Yes, I do. Those photographs that you took? Yes. And did you take them from your home? Yes. Two of them, uh, one was taken from my bedroom window, one was taken from my front porch, and the other one was taken from my mailbox. Okay. And you described to the court what we're about to introduce here for the court. What are these pictures of? Oh, these pictures? Yes, ma'am. That you gave me? They were pictures of some of the various vehicles that have been over at the house. Just, it's fair to say this is like a random day in the life of your next door neighbor? Yes. Collective two, yes. Exhibit two, collective. I'll renew my relevance objection, Judge. Same really. Sure. I'm assuming you're introducing these to show the use and possession. The possession of the house and what is being used for during the time that the defendant has possession. And the waste is going on over at the house, and you know, we just don't know. It is so. for that reason, Mr. Baker, I'm allowing it to be introduced. Did you get the. If I could approach Judge. Um, Show you this picture and ask you if you took that picture. No, I didn't take this picture. What is that a picture of? I will object to that. If she didn't take the picture, she can't authenticate it. Well, there she can. You can authenticate it if it, as to whether or not it, it represents a true and accurate representation of what she observed on a particular day. Um, I don't think it requires that you take the picture before you can authenticate what it is. So overrule the objection. So this is a picture of the bags and boxes that were outside of the home uh, one day. This was just one of the occasions. Did you see that yourself? Uh, I did see this myself, but I did not take the picture. All right. But is this a fair and accurate depiction of looks like a lot of trash and a lot of boxes and things that are just being discarded out of the home? Yes. And does it look like quite a bit of stuff? It does look like quite a bit of stuff. Next exhibit, Judge. Exhibit three. Ready, Mr. Holland? I am, Judge. We have just a minute. I have the color photograph of that. I don't know where it comes. Oh, we'll do the black and white.
to understand, Ms. Johnson, let me show you these three pictures. I want to ask you if you recall the day that these pictures were taken. Yes, I do. Did you take these pictures? Yes, I did. And what do, do these pictures appear to be? They are pictures of uh, Chris Claiborne's truck being towed off the property. How did you find that that day that his truck was being towed off of the property? Uh, extremely odd because, uh, so may I back up a minute? Go ahead. So I was first contacted on the 6th of March by uh, Mr. Claiborne's daughter, Sydney Claiborne, letting me know he had been removed from the home. I want to jack to the here side. Um, Holly, you have any exception? I'm sustained. You can't testify what somebody said, but you can testify as to why you saw okay. the picture to be unusual. Okay. Well, I, I felt that I, the pictures were odd. There were new cars being that are showing up at the house. Here, his vehicle is being removed. Boxes are coming in and out. Trash is put outside. So it was unusual. Next exhibit, Judge. And I'll look that up with some of Mr. Clegg's testimony as well. Since she took the pictures, I want to move. <clears throat> I'm going to show you a document. I want to ask you if you Recall this document. Yes, I do. And what is this document? This is an email that I sent to you on the 29th of March with a text message that I had received from Amy Childress. Got it. And can you read the email into the, into the record? Uh, yes, I the email I said. Do you think this is something I should go to the police about? Her ear, her text message says, "Hi, Jerry. This is your neighbor, Amy. I just wanted to reach out and apologize if you if I if you feel I have annoyed you in any way. I've been nothing but kind and supportive, asking if y'all ever needed anything. I apologize for all the cars coming and going, but it is for my safety, and I have not had one party." Also, I have had no more cars in my driveway than you have. There were more vehicles in my driveway when Chris lived here. I will try and get the yard mode if that is an annoyance as soon as I have the funds. I would use our current yard guy, but Chris still owes him $400 from not paying last year. That being said, Reese Holly has made it known to many that you are taking pictures of my home and the cars coming in it. I also saw the pictures yesterday from the stand on Reese Holly and Chris's table. Detective Lovell is also aware you have admitted to taking pictures to Reese to Reese Holly. Reese Holly, that is a direct violation of an order of protection and bond conditions that you are fully aware of against my husband. Some of the pictures taken are also of off-duty police officers and security. Just so you are aware. I am asking you to stop taking pictures of my home and communicating anything back to my husband or his attorney in regards to me or any activity at 5278 Highway 70 East. Per law enforcement, Chris is no longer a resident at this address currently. If this does not stop immediately, I will call the police and get the detective and DA involved. I have also made my attorney aware of the situation and he will move forward with legal action next. This is also to make you aware you are not allowed on my property, and if you are, I will file charges of trespassing as this is your official warning. Please do not respond back to me. If you feel that I am being an annoyance at any time, please reach out to the police and they can handle it as they are fully aware of the situation. So, when you receive this email, <coughs> um, how did you take this email? Well, it was a text message and text she message. sent it to me from both of the phone numbers I have for her. Uh, I took it as a threat. Had you already been to court? This was on Wednesday, March 29th, correct? That was the day after the first court hearing. Okay. And the first court hearing, you're talking about the hearing in White Bluff City Court? 
Yes, sir. Uh, and you showed up there to be a witness. Uh, I was subpoenaed there to be a witness. Yes. And you felt like she was sending you this after that court appearance. Yes. Am I understanding this right? This neighbor is creeping out of her blinds, taking pictures of everything the neighbor is doing, reporting back to the husband, using it against her in court. She writes her a letter asking her to stop and telling her that she'll correct the things that are wrong. And if there's anything really wrong, go to the police and please stay out of my business, which, you know, probably it's not terribly unreasonable. You know, her lawyer probably would get upset about it. And this lady thinks that she's threatening her. While she's standing at the window spying on her neighbor. Is she cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs or am I just not understanding this? OMG. Did any of the law enforcement at all, the d detective level, or anybody ever contact you outside of outside of Miss Childers at all? No. Okay. I would make that to next file exhibit judge. So it's it's Fair to say that, that there's issues between apparently Miss Childress and you being her neighbor, correct? There is now, yes. What um, what has that caused you to do in the last couple of years, especially since you've gotten this text message? Well, it's caused my whole family uh, and I to be uncomfortable in our home. We've constrained our dogs uh, so that they don't have full access to the yard very often. Um, we have been in the past we don't lock our doors now we lock our doors uh, and when i'm out of away from the home i turn on the security if i'm home by myself i turn on the security alarm and who lives with you at your address my father my mother my sister and my 12 year old daughter okay and have they witnessed all the same yes they have okay and how do you uh have, have you noticed that or whether or not it's affected them in any manner absolutely and what have you witnessed about that? Well, my parents are, uh, I wouldn't even call it paranoid, um, but you have to understand they are professional dog handlers. And so the dogs that we have uh, are very expensive and they're afraid that their animals will be harmed. They're also confirmed, concerned about my own safety. I'm plugged up to the big screen and I'm wondering if there's a button that we could flip. Screen. I have a video I'd like to, and this is the end of it. I'd like to play one video that she's- What kind of dogs do you all have? Eagles. <clears throat> Let me show you a video here and I'll ask some questions about it. day that that happened yes. the night that that the happened, night that happened yeah. yes and when was that do you remember i don't remember the exact date um was it during a time that miss childress had the property or mr claiborne had the property miss childress okay i can tell you the truck left once and it was like two o'clock in the morning it returned back about 2 20 and then it left again at three o'clock. That was it leaving at three o'clock in the morning. Okay, and you heard the loud muffler. Did it sound like that at your house? Yes, my bedroom, I sleep with the window open and it, my bedroom window is the closest to the Claiborne house. Can you sleep for the truck coming and going? Uh, no. Did that 
uh, also affect the other members of your house that evening? Uh, uh, with all due respect, now I do think we're venturing into something that's irrelevant on the possession of the marital residence. I sympathize with her about how it affects her, but going into how it affects her family, I think, is beyond the pale. Fair enough. Your witness. Well, I would move that, that video in as an exhibit. Do you have a copy of it for the record? I've, I've got that and the other photos on this thumb drive. I would like to have the opportunity maybe to present that to the court. To you or to be made a late file exhibit if you want. That's what I'm asking, a late file exhibit to that. But I've got to give them a thumb drive if they need to. be submitted to exhibit six. Sergeant, I want to lodge an objection to that. There was nothing established that that car even pulled into this house car on the road and they're trying to infer something that shows the truck backing up and then it leaving the driveway and I'm familiar with this location of these two houses this is the one on highway 70 right yes you know, sir towards King, almost to Craigie almost Hope. to Kingston Springs Craigie almost Hope. To Craigie Hope. yes sir I know where it is I know the houses I watched them being built so I'm familiar with it and I understand what she's saying about the fact that a vehicle that leaves at three o'clock in the morning would be something she would recognize her testimony is that she recorded the truck leaving uh, the home that was being possessed by Ms. Childress at 2.33 or 2 or 2.20 and 3, and I'm allowing it for that purpose. Okay. Do you know, do you know, go ahead. It, it, her testimony was she was familiar with it. Her sister took the video while she was standing right beside her. So if that comes out that way, I didn't want to mislead the court. This is a temporary possession, a temporary hearing anyway. Do you know who was driving that truck? No, sir. All right, so how do you, why are you saying that that's relevant to that house? Explain to me, an because unknown truck pulls in there. Prior to Mr. Claiborne being removed from the home, we didn't have any of this going on. We didn't have unknown vehicles in and out all hours of the night. I didn't have, if they were having a party or such, or, you know, let's say he was running his race car, I knew what the noises were. That's what. Well, that's kind of, you know, take me through that, because to me that's specious reasoning. Just because something happens after he moved out, it had to be related to, miss, to, to who, had, who had possession of the house? Right, but there were a lot of things going on. Items being removed, uh, trash being removed, moving boxes moving in. There were lots of things going on. A truck moved, removed from his parking lot or his driveway. Um, there were lots of, no, that was not normal. All right, it's not normal for a person having a divorce that had their, that whose husband got arrested for domestic assault, was served an order of protection. You're telling me that's not unusual? I did not know about any, I knew that he had been removed from the home, but I can tell you that as much stuff was moving out of that home was not moved in when she moved. Why is it any of your business in the first place? Because I am the neighbor and I look out for my community. All right, who told you to take these pictures? Nobody told me to take those pictures. Well, I took those pictures on my own without anybody knowing until the truck was towed off the property and I talked to my family about it and they suggested I reach out to Mr. Claiborne. Well, how, how do you think it would make the neighbor feel if you had a Snoopy neighbor taking pictures of them all the I time? would hope that if something like that at my house was going on, that they'd take pictures too. Because you're the standard that everybody should live by. Yeah, I'm going to object. We're going to argumentative here. Saying, argumentative. All right, this picture of the two women in the hot tub. What's unusual about that? Usually the hot tub is run at night when the uh, lights are dark and nobody's there. So you take issue with the time of day somebody's using the hot tub? I was taking issue of all the different people that were in and out of that house. Do you know these two people? Nope. These cars, do you know who these cars belong to? Only the black Armada, the blue Jeep that you see in there occasionally, um, and that's it. Well, it sounds like to me you're more worried about the one car because you don't know who this one car belongs to. No, there were more than one car. May I approach the witness, Judge? You may. Can you show me where there's another car? This is another car. This is another car. There's also been a truck. There's been a red car. Show me the truck in that picture. There's not. It's not in this picture. It's in the other picture. I asked you how many. You identified two vehicles and you said there's a third. Right, the Armada that is usually there. All right. Do you know who the Armada belongs to? Yes, Mr. Claiborne. Okay. 
At the time Mr. Claiborne lived there, there was more vehicles than that in the driveway, correct? Yes. The difference is you just don't know who they are now. Exactly. So this sounds more like neighbor who's in the neighbor's business is worried and complaining. Judge, I'm object again. Is that not true? Argumentative, sustained. Judge, I think that's a fair question. What's the difference between, okay, if I know who the cars are and there's more cars there before the divorce, now there's less cars there, but by her own admission, it's because I can't identify at least one of those cars. Something's unusual. I think the motivation, Mr. Baker, in taking the photographs or whatever is, is what you were arguing about. But she is a fact witness about the activities that have been going on at the house. Her reasons or motivation for doing it is not, is not relevant. What she's been brought in as a witness is to show that there's this, this is what's going on. So that's the reason I'm sustaining that the question is argumentative. All right, I'll rephrase the question. There's less cars there now after Mr. Claver moved out, correct? Uh, no, there's not. Then why a minute ago when I asked you, you said there were more cars there when he lived there? He has a truck. He has his work van. He has the Armada. He has a boat. He has a trailer. And then on occasion, her blue Jeep is there. And friends come over sometimes and visit and so forth, correct? Right. And I usually know those vehicles as well. All right. So that's the whole problem here, right? No. No further questions, Judge. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. You may be released from your subpoena. Thank you. All right, next witness. Oh, Mr. Clayman. Clayman, come around, please. Okay. Raise your right hand and face our clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to have the truth, all truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You're Chris Clayman, correct? Yes. And you're married to Amy Chilvers, correct? Yes, sir. When did you get married? October 3rd, something like that. What year? Um, 2022. So this has been a five-month marriage. Yes, sir. If I'm counting on my fingers right. Um, first off, uh, the house, you've seen the photographs. Um, do you own that house? I have, sir. Me and my late wife purchased it around, I think, 2016, 15, 16, something like that. If I can approach, Judge. The testimony the last time you recorded got continued. You went and got a true copy of your deed, correct? Yes, sir, that's the deed that still shows my name on the property and plus my late wife's name. And that was from 2016, correct? Yes, sir. So if anything, that's about a six some odd month uh, situation that you've owned that home. Six years. Six years, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. It's, I think it was in June is when we actually purchased the home of that year. Next exhibit. Seven. Seven. You heard my opening statement that you guys moved in in December into that home, correct? Yes, sir. Was that, was that yes, accurate? Sir. I yes, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Um, you know, when you lived there, you heard your neighbor's testimony. Uh, what type of uh, wild parties did you have? Uh, not really many. We had a we had a, new, a party for my daughter uh, for. I think it was maybe New Year's or somewhere right around in there, or some kind of a party or a Christmas party or something other, and we had a bunch of her friends over there. Uh, generally, though, anytime I was going to have anything going on at the home, I'd say, hey, there's gonna, I would talk to the neighbors. We'd always communicate back and forth and say, hey, there's going to be people in and out or whatever, or I'm going to be gone or something other like that. And then my, like, and then a lot of times on the weekends, my daughter, if she was at home, she would have some friends that here or there over, but very rarely. And... I mean, you're familiar with these photographs that your neighbor took, correct? You yes, said that. Yes, sir. Is there anybody in these photographs that you recognize? Well, I, I, when they was first took, no. But after the fact, after I found out who one of the girls was that was in the hot tub, uh, I did know that I found out I know who that is now, after the fact. Does that cause you concern with your house being used in that fashion? It does, because it's a brand new home, and, it, and you're seeing so many people come in and out of the home that I don't know what's being brought in and out of my home, what's being done to my home. I mean, there's a lot of valuable things in that home. I mean, you know, I mean, there's like high dollar TVs, uh, there's weapons in the home. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in the home. There's all kinds of jewelry in, in the home. I still got a lot of my jewelry there that got removed from the house. Some of my late wife's wedding bands and stuff are still there. 
uh, you know, that's thousands of dollars worth of stuff in this home that's just sitting there with all these people coming in and out. And I have no idea what, what's going on inside that home now. And to be clear, when you were living with Miss Childress during the 90, I guess, or so days, more or less, that uh, she was there, did, did y'all live like that? No, sir. No, so like I said, we had the one party she catered for my daughter. Um, I think it was like a Christmas party or something like that, some kind of a party, and we had a bunch of her friends over there. Other than that, the whole time we lived there, Miss Childress never had one guest come to that home because she, of her that, that I can recall that, that she knew. Most of her friends, you know, whether they live in Nashville or, her, or her, her sister lives out of town in East Tennessee. And I don't even met her once at a, at a wedding. So, so the night I had some, some of my family members would come over, like my aunt would come every couple of weeks and clean the home or something like that. We had, they had the yard guys of idea. So you had business credit cards. Yes, sir. You have any concerns as to how they've been used by Ms. Childress during this time? Yes, sir. Tell the court about that. Um, I had looked down one day on my phone and I was thinking, well, I haven't checked my, my business, one of my business cards. I carry, I carry two Chase cards and an American Express card for work. And I logged into my Chase app to see if there was a payment, a payment due. And then all of a sudden, this was the week after uh, uh, I had left the home. And I looked down and all of a sudden it's showing over $4,000. And Amazon purchases made in, in one week. So I got I got Chase on the phone and I shut the credit card down and trying to figure out what's going on, where is these over four thousand dollars in purchases coming from. And and they told me that I had to contact Objection. Hearsay. Nothing in the period of hearsay. Uh, I would say it was somebody else told you. Judge that, you know, this is a for all intent and purposes of business record. It was a business credit card that, that he has, and he's looking at his- that, but you, what you're asking him to repeat is a statement made by someone at the credit card company to, he wants to, you want him to repeat what someone else told him to introduce that statement as true, right? Well, if, are you trying to say what somebody has told you, not what well, you they, saw? All, all they told me who would contact. No, you can't testify as to what somebody told okay. you. Let's leave it there, okay, okay. keep going. So I, uh, I I looked and seen that the charges were all Amazon charges. So I called Amazon, and on each one of the charge on each on each charge, it had like a HQ number H number on it. And I asked them, I said, "What is this charge?" And they tell me what Judge, each purchase. Can't testify what they oh, told you. Okay. Based on your phone call with Amazon, then what did you do next? Uh, I, I shut that car down and I, uh, I flighted all its fraudulent activity because it was nothing that I had purchased. When you look back over your business card and the Amazon statements, what type of things were being purchased? Uh, vacuum sealer, dish sets, curtains, I, uh, some kind of a reef was being purchased. Uh, I mean, there was soaps, there was uh, a mouthwash rinse thing bought. Uh, I mean, it was just it was just on and on. There was cases of dog food being bought. I mean, it was just it was just stuff that you would just stuff that I would never even think about buying. I mean, it's just it was just purchase after purchase after purchase of just different things. Right, and according to it the was statement, like, it was movie prescri uh, subscriptions. It was uh, Amazon subscriptions, and I'm like, it just it just went on for like like five days of these the purchases just went on. And again, with your business account in that situation. Could you tell where all the stuff's being shipped to? Yes, sir, I could. It was being shipped to the house, and to, uh, did to you, my house. Did you order it? No, sir, I did not. Did Mrs. Childress have uh, any permission from you to use that account for those purposes? Not for that, no, sir. The forklift company, um, we'll strike that. May I approach? You may. Look, I want to show you a document and ask you if you recognize that document. Yes, sir, I do. And that's a document that um, you put together that shows what? Uh, it shows all of the purchases that was made. Um, from uh, 
three different credit cards of mine that uh, some of those, all those credit some of the credit cards that was at the house not even in my possession uh, the, like the one from AT&T uh, that car was at the home when there was uh, $1,100 it's like charged on it in one day uh, and then Dixon storage there was $1,600 charged uh, in one day back-to-back -back charges of you heard Miss Childress testify at White Bluff City Court about that yes sir what did she say about those charges? she said that she felt that she needed to go uh, um, pay her storage unit up for not like, like it was like nine months was something I think I believe it was nine months is what she testified to um, was there an Instacart purchase there on was there? an Instacart purchase on there how um, much was well, what was that for uh, are we still on the possession of the house or were you talking about that well these are credit cards that were at the house and one of the reasons after she's taking over the house one of the things she's going through and finding and you know, based on her being able to have access to the house, is actually using, um, and it's going to equate to about seven thousand dollars in ten days. The court's interested in that. Fine. If you're not, I'll move on. I just think we are limited to what the motions are, which is possession of the house. Unless there's a motion down regarding the assessment of debts and so forth. Now, obviously, there's a restraining uh, statutory injunction. Um, you know that. Prohib that prohibits things, but waste. I'm offered to show waste at the house because there's no other person that could have gotten these credit cards and used them in such fashion. Um, it certainly implies that she's you know went rifling through the drawers and things and found some of this stuff and flat taken advantage of. Let me ask this one question, I'll get off of it. The Instacart is that for groceries? It is. It was. Uh, it showed to be two purchases: one for five hundred thirty-eight dollars and one for three hundred nine dollars. And when you researched that, where was it delivered to? It was delivered to the front porch of the of the residence. Did uh, you make that purchase? No, sir. I did not. Judge, I would ask this to be the next exhibit. I'd object to relevance, Judge. I'm sorry. I'd object to relevance. Um, he's made his argument as to what's relevant, so I'll allow it for the purpose of showing any waste that's occurring because of her possession of the house. The forklift company that you own is C&K Forklift? Yes, sir, it is. And what's the C&K stand for? Uh, Chris and Kim. So that was uh, a company that was how old? Reverly, uh, five, six years old now. Okay. And I'm assuming then because of the name you and your deceased wife started that company? Yes, sir, it was, it was, it was formed solely in my name. Sorry, I get upset when I talk about her. Um, it was. It's always been solely in my name, but she was. She was. She done all the billing to the company, the, a lot of the communications back and forth with the customers, and stuff like that. When yeah. it when it comes to any kind of daily bank business, daily businesses. So what's going on over at the house then, in regards to your business? You you and we've alleged that you need in the house to keep up with your business activities. Absolutely. Tell the court how you use your home for your business and why you need uh, to get possession of the marital residence for your business, okay? As of, as of right now, my, it is costing me more money out of, the, out of my pocket to run the business than I'm making off of the business because a lot of the stuff that I have in the garage is stuff that I keep pre-ordered and pre-bought as far as like service and stuff, filters and oils and all kinds of stuff in the home uh, that I have to turn around. We're talking some of these filters are over over a hundred dollars a pop, and you know, and, and we're looking you know, at several of them at times. You know, we're talking thousands upon thousands of dollars just just in parts sitting in the garage that I need access to daily. But I mean, I never know from day to day what I'm going to need unless it's something we already have pre-scheduled service. I mean, I get different calls for different stuff every day, but it could be something that I have in the home that if I don't have it, I'm having to turn around and go order it from somewhere else. And then so now that I'm out money double for what some I've already purchased that I had had at the home. I'm trying to say sometimes you don't know what you need need to you get to on the scene of the Yeah, I mean, and, and the unless it's something we do routine maintenance on. Um, I, I, have, I keep filters and stuff at the house for like routine maintenance and stuff on certain accounts that I do on a regular basis, like for 30, 60, or 90 days. But but any other stuff like that, you know, there's, there's all kinds of like mis miscellaneous odd and end parts inside the house that I've kept over the years and stuff that I, I, de I need access to when I do need them. But the filters and stuff that I have to have on a daily basis, in fact, customers do to be serviced, I keep all that stuff pre bought ahead. So, has um, 
strike that. Do you know if, if well, how have you been living since you were removed from the home due to the domestic bond conditions and this order of protection? Uh, I have spent, uh, I'm sorry. Objection to the form of the question. There was about three qualifiers in that question. I'll rephrase. Rephrase your question. Where have you been living? Uh, I've stayed several different places. Some nights I've had to stay in a motel. Uh, I've had to, I've had to stay uh, at some of my late wife's families. I've stayed. Uh, I've been staying with uh, with my aunt, which was the, uh, one of the employees that works for me. Uh, I've been staying with them. Um, I've had to pretty much almost just be homeless for the last for the last month. I've been homeless, you know, I, and it's live live place to place. Do you have like a Mother, father, family support around here that you can lean on. I uh, just my aunt is really the only one that really has this been been able to uh, stay with. You know, if uh, Miss Childress in your relationship with her, however brief, do you know if she has funds to go and and get a place? Uh, I've witnessed her uh, receive a check for about eighteen or nineteen thousand dollars from the VA. Uh, for her father's estate that was money that was left over in the VA that she deposited into the bank. Um, and then numerous times when we first started dating, she had sold her father's home and, and collected the money off of that. And she, she had told me that she had put, I think, thirty forty thousand dollars $40,000 in cash down on a Jeep, and then she'd put another 20000 into the Jeep. And then she had turned around and wrote a check, I think, for maybe $20,000 to... Um, to the guy that she sold the house to to turn around and rent the house back for a year because that's where she was living when we met and that's when she didn't and that's why she didn't move into my home until December because the house was still paid up for the year and then and then uh, amongst that she had took and went to Florida and bought she told me upwards of ten thousand dollars in, in uh, uh, plants for a business that she was running and then and then I think that last December or late early January. Uh, I had took her to a plastic surgeon in Nashville, and she paid uh, for a breast for breast implants, which, which was about I think eight to ten thousand dollars. She wrote a check for that day, uh, so she has a lot of money. It's just she's got, she's got it put away where it's hard to where she doesn't want anybody to see it. You've heard her talk about the Regents Bank account when we were in Black Bluff City Court, yes, correct? Sir. Yes, sir. Did she ever answer the question about? No, sir. She would not answer how much money she had in the bank. She kept saying she, she, I know she has more than one Regents account. I think she has about three. And what I've seen her over the, over the times when she would help me pay some of the bills at the house, if it wouldn't go through on one account, she said, "Hold on, here's my other card, or I, I need to transfer money, transfer money from one account to the other." Um, so, so she has multiple bank accounts through Regions. Do uh, you have knowledge that she has reliable transportation on her own? She does. She has a, a 2017 Jeep Wrangler. Uh, that there's really nothing wrong with it. She, she just, um, from, my, from my understanding, from what I've been. Being here and seeing that uh, my step, I mean, my daughter has been driving the, the Jeep everywhere around Dixon County and, and uh, up towards Cookville and East Tennessee for the last month. And what vehicle has she been using? Uh, who, uh, my, my wife now? Yes. She's been driving my late wife's Armada. Okay. Are you aware that Miss Childers has a GoFundMe page? It took me a minute to figure this one out. So, Sydney Claiborne is. Mr. Claiborne's daughter or stepdaughter, I'm not sure which, and she has apparently joined forces with the wife because dad kicked her out of the house at some point prior to this whole incident with the wife. She created a GoFundMe for stepmom and it says that, hello, I'm asking for all my people out there to help Amy out. She's an engineer. Um, she married my father last year and things went have only went downhill. He has drained and logged into her accounts. My father's been arrested three times due to domestic assault and breaking bond restrictions against her. He is not a resident in the address where they lived and turned off the utilities today. Amy is taking care of her parrot lab and my father's two pugs. If any of my friends out there can help us so we can get things taken care of, as he broke bond restrictions again, my Venmo. I yeah okay this is interesting i do i was made aware of that yesterday uh, uh for for reasons uh, i was told why it was made and then i'm and then there are not true reasons that's all i have thank you
Well, well, how much money is in these region bank accounts that you say exist? Uh, so one of them, she told me she had, when we first got together, she told me she had around $100,000 in it. And when was that when you first got together? About a year ago. About a year ago. How year much ago. is in it now? Sir, I don't know. I, I'm not on none of her accounts, and she's not on none of my accounts as far as when it comes to banking. You don't know. The only one that knows your I can wife's tell you, I, I know. I know how much was in the one account when she received the check in the mail when we were still when she got the check from her father's estate. I know that. I know that check was put into the bank. So I know. I know the amount of that check. It was around nineteen thousand dollars. Well, the truth is, there's things you complain you're trying to point out here about the breast augmentation and so forth. That's where all prior to marriage. Correct? So, yeah, most of them were, yeah. Yep. So that money was spent prior to marriage, correct? And this Jeep Wrangler, uh, your daughter's driving that, and the only thing you left your wife to drive was the Armada, correct? Uh, I was told that night that she had to have one vehicle there to drive, and I said she has a Jeep in the garage. She argued the fact about that, and then they made me leave the Armada. So this Jeep that, that your daughter is driving is the one that would be thirty to forty thousand dollars was spent on, according to you. That's what Miss uh, Chair told me. She had to put that. She put thirty or forty thousand down in cash when she bought it, uh, so she could get it financed because because she had filed she had just filed bankruptcy. All right. So she put a thirty to forty thousand dollars on a twenty seventeen Jeep a year ago. When I spent about about two years ago, it was before we met. She had already done it. Well, two years ago would have been 2020, correct? Yeah, but she had, 20, but she had told me she had received 200 and something thousand dollars off the off the estate of her dad when she sold the home, so oh. off the house, so forth. Now I guess that would be a public record to find, to find the exact price. Okay. Are you just where are you getting these numbers? I'm from her. I mean, I, I don't know. That's what okay. she's telling me. Okay. So it's the probate's still not open. Uh, I don't know. I've not spoke to her in a month. I don't know what's going on with that. And I know she received the, the check from the VA. Of the money that was left over in his account. Well, well, let's get back on topic. Name a single thing that's been damaged in that house since your wife's had possession of it. I've not been on the property in 30 days. I couldn't tell you. You don't know a single thing that's been damaged, correct? I, not that I know of because I haven't been on the property. Then why are you claiming waste? Well, I mean, from the pictures I'm seeing, there's been all this stuff being towed in and out of the house. There's all these people coming in and out. There's been over $8,000 in credit card charges made. and. If, if you're buying eight or nine hundred dollars in groceries, I mean, how does one person need to live off eight or nine hundred dollars of groceries? And, and you're buying, or and all these people, are you, are you having parties over for other people? Who are you buying nine hundred dollars worth of groceries for? Truth of the matter is, you're just worried because you don't know what's going on over there. Sir, right? I, I, like I said, sir, I just want my home back. It's my home. I've had the home prior to our marriage, and you know, I just own what I own and what me and my late wife worked for destroyed. Was you in the neighboring collusion on the pictures? Sir, I did not meet her until a couple years ago until she moved in. Did you have your uh, relative that worked for the police department? Did you have her case in your wife? No, sir, I did not. Was he recently terminated? Uh, from what I understand, he was terminated, but for uh, some images that was found on his cell phone, from what I'm understanding. I don't, I don't know the whole details behind it. Okay. Well, let me go through this. Uh, do you know who made these charges on here? Uh, yes, sir, I do. I was told. It's who I was told by Amazon who made the charges and who, who's, whose account they was purchased off of, I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I, I want to go through here. at and Wireless, there's two charges on there. Tell me how that affects the value of the house or any waste of that house. Well, for one, that car was in the house and that purchase was made while I was sitting in jail for something I didn't do. Do you know what waste of property is? Um, there's probably different definitions of it by everybody. Well, waste of properties for lawyers means that you're doing something to diminish the value of that real estate. Show me something on here that diminishes the value of that real estate. Judge, I'm going to object. Uh, that's not the definition, and that's not what it was offered for. I've already said what it was offered for as far as what's going, rifling through the drawers and pulling up the credit cards, and that's the reason why it's being offered. Those cards should have never been used. It was one of those situations where she or anybody with access is charged, and that's well, the waste part of it. Mr. Baker is right about one thing, and that is that waste as it relates to real property is one thing. Waste as it relates to dissipation of assets in the divorce of personal property and monies is a different thing. You don't call it waste, you call it dissipation of an asset. But uh, you introduce this inf this information on the idea that those credit cards were there and in the house and this is what they've been used for, which I don't think goes to the issue of possession of the house. I think it's irrelevant. So 
I am overruling your objection. You brought it up. Mr. Baker can question about it, but none of it's relevant about the possession of the house. Well, it goes to the question of dissipation of assets well, regarding I'm, the personal property and economic aspect. Okay, well, hold on. Let me back up a minute. So that we're not considering this going to the house because if it is, I'm, I'm going to put it as a question. I'm not considering that as the issue. Okay, then I've got no more questions about that. Kind of threw me when you got me on my relevance objections. So I thought you it were going somewhere you with sustained it. sustained your position? Yeah, well, no, you no, know, the previous one when you when you this was introduced I object to it for relevance so then I'm like well, I allowed it but then it yeah. had no real relevance to what right. I have to decide after reviewing the file the only issue before me is possession of the house I don't think it really relates to that so. okay and then that wraps up my questions judge anything further for this witness no sir thank you sir you may stand thank down. you sure Holly you may call your next witness I have a moment with Mr. Claver please Mr. Holly? We're good, Judge. That's all I have. All right. Mr. Baker, you wish to call any witnesses? I'll call Mr. Childress briefly, Judge. Mr. Childress, you will come forward, please. Raise your right hand, let the clerk place you under oath. You solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, all truth, and but the truth, so help you God. Yes, ma'am. They sound redundant. Let's state your name for the record, please. Amy Lee Childress. All right, Ms. Childress, when did you move in with uh, your husband? I mean, it was closer to the end of October. Right. He testified December, but your, your recollection is October. Okay. That's correct. All right, now uh, I want to stick straight to the topic. Why do you need possession of that house? Because, and I don't want to own the house. However, I do need time to get out of the house I need the financial funding, basically where I was at prior to living in the house, and he would not let me go back to work. He wanted me to work for CNK Forklift and gave me a handful of credit cards for me to use as money. And I have five hundred and ninety-four dollars coming in a month, which is my dad's state retirement. Okay. You have any other source of income right this minute? No, sir. Everything else is tied up in the state of Terry Childress, and there's. Like I said, a pending lawsuit. All right. How much money do you have in bank accounts? Um, I do have three, three regions accounts. Um, the first two accounts, each one of those have less than $200 in them. I couldn't tell you the exact number because I've had to shut off all my online banking as well as my cards and as well as the estate of Terry Childress. That is the check that Chris was referring to because right. nothing's been paid out yet. All right. Did you start a GoFundMe? Page. I did not start a GoFundMe well, page. Did somebody start one on your behalf? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you know who did that by chance? Um, yes, sir. It was actually Chris's daughter, Sydney Claiborne. Okay, gotcha. All right. Now, you, you realize, you know, your, your husband's going to get the house back, obviously. Absolutely. I want him to. Okay. But how much time are you needing to get moved out of the house and get ready? If I've got the resources available to me, I mean, I can be out 30 days or less. I mean, I want to be out based on... The pictures that are being shown I'm stopped non-stop right. what was your financial position when you came into this marriage um I had I had a job making six figures I was an engineer uh, we're right at six figures of course I had my dad's estate money coming in and you know I had I don't I don't know probably fifty thousand dollars or so I mean I, I did have money in savings however we've blown through that what, what do you mean specifically? What do you mean in since October? What happened to that fifty thousand dollars? Well, I mean, I had the fifty thousand dollars. I mean, Chris and I dated for a year and a half, and I paid for everything. Or we would go places, and I paid for every trip. Or we would go to the store together, and he would not bring out his credit card. I would bring out my debit card. So I paid for a lot of stuff and lost a lot of money. Okay. Give me the total amount of money you think that you've got right now access to. That I currently have access to, right. to me. Um, $400 is what I've got in my bank account. And I have, I believe, $600. And that's set aside to continue to retain you. Okay. How much, how much was your lease with, that you terminated when you moved in with your husband? $2,400, I believe. 
Were, were you still at Electrolux at that time working at Engineer? I was, correct. I was a, technically it was HCL. I was a contract engineer for that company, Electrolux. Okay. All right. So, so I'm going to get back to the question because ultimately the question is how much, how much time do you think it would take or money to get you back on your feet to get you moved out? I mean, if I had if I had basically three thousand dollars a month, which would cover a house for six months and utilities until I can get a job again and get packed up, I mean, I'm willing to go sleep on someone's couch and be out of there within thirty days. However, I do need funding until I can get a job. I have to have resources. Gotcha. Do you know? Anybody, any other relatives close that you could live with? I don't. I had a mother, or she was like a mother of 20 some years. She passed away in May, and then that was our neighbor. And the following month, my father passed away in, in June. Okay. And do you think you could, and I know, I know we don't have a crystal ball, do you think that you might be able to have employment within 60 days? As long as I'm not tied up in a courtroom nonstop, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right, fair enough. And nothing's been destroyed in that house. Absolutely that not. And if anything, I've been cleaning the house and I've been moving his late wife's marital property from storage back into the marital residence and placing the items where they were at prior to I moved in. Okay. Now that picture of the it looked like some trash bags or something outside the porch. Maybe it's pizza boxes. What was that? Um, so Chris hardly took the trash off. It was Logan Brown that always took it off. Right. I did not feel safe leaving the house. So the night that Chris was arrested, I threw all the trash that he had previously piled up in the garage. I threw it right outside the garage door. I shut the door and then Logan Brown picked it all up in his truck or trailer and hauled it off the next day. All right. The white pickup truck, do you know anything? Who was driving that white pickup truck? The one with the muffler? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. It was Curry Hicks. Is that a deputy? Uh, she, she works for the county jail. Yes, okay. sir. And uh, you know what she was checking? What was she doing out there? Um, she was, I've had a lot of friends reach out because I am in fear for my safety, especially when I've seen what I've seen, and I won't go into it because there's an active investigation with the city of White Bluff. Mm -hmm. However, um, she had came by the house because she drives by Jeremy Duke's house on the way to and from work, and she left in, at that time of the morning because she wanted to make sure that my husband was not living there, which was a violation. Right. All right, and it was Mr. Duke, was he at the uh, White Bluff Police Department? Mr. Duke was not at the White Bluff Police Department. Um, Mr. Duke was at home with Chris Claiborne. Okay. All right. And that's, that's my understanding, that's what she told me. Okay, Mr. <coughs> Holly may ask you some questions. Okay. So, all right, Ms. Childers, is it fair to say then you're capable of making six figures a year? Yes, sir, I am very capable if I have the time and I'm not tied up in a courtroom nonstop. I, I was in a courtroom personally with you twice last week and preparing and working with investigators and detectives. That's my full time job right now. This happened uh, like the 5th or so of March. And we just started court last week. What have you done from like the 5th or 6th of March to last week to uh, find a place to stay? Like I said, I've been working on packing up items and they're my charges, which were made with a card with my name on them. I had purchased storage units to pack up my belongings. And then I was issued a restraining order from you not to move anything out. So. Do I move out? Do I stay? So that's where I'm at. Uh, I will confirm and tell you, I absolutely do not want the house. I do not want to stay in the house any longer than 30 days. I just need arrangements to get out of the house and the funds to do so. I, I do not want to be there. Well, all fair is it's, it's not your house. It's not my house. Have you ever told anybody that you were going to stay in that house forever? Um, I have not, but actually I have a recording of my husband saying if I would go make a false police report that he would put my name on the deed. Did you ever tell, you know Pat Jones, you're familiar with her, Yes. Right? Did you ever tell Miss Jones that you're going to stay in that house for as long as it takes? Uh, nope. Absolutely not. So if she comes in here and says that, then she's not being very truthful. That would be a lie. Uh, sustain the blue gloves. 
You said that you had, uh, uh, in, in previous testimony, Wild Bluff City Corps, you, you said you had ordered a lot of that stuff on Amazon and you agreed that you were, you were getting curtains for the house, correct? And that is correct. So if you're not doing anything unsafe, and the, the reason for that was so that your neighbor couldn't see in. Uh, the reason for that is based on the number of pictures that have been taken of this house. I did not feel safe, especially since she's communicating with my husband and there's an order of protection and bond conditions. In you place. lived over there for a long period of time without those curtains on those windows, correct? Yes, and I complained about that then and my husband said we would get blinds and put up. So if you're not doing anything unsavory in that house, why would you need those curtains? Again, like I said, because there's an order of protection, there's bond conditions out, and like you clearly made available to the court, there are a lot of pictures of my every move being taken. You didn't like that, did you? It's not that I don't like it, it's creepy. Because the amount of time that those girls were in the hot tub was maybe five minutes. And you have pictures of every vehicle coming in and out of my driveway, including Mr. Claiborne's own half-brother, who is an Police, a police officer with Mount Pleasant who came by the house to go meet with me in Detective Lovell. So yes, it is creepy, which is why I want out of the house. May I approach? May. Show us on Show you up document and ask you if you recognize that document yes sir, I do. that's a Facebook post it is absolutely and that's your Facebook post correct? yes and you posted this yes and there's a there's a photo in a frame and who is in that photo that is Chris's late mother okay. or late late wife I'm late sorry wife, yep and there are two wedding rings in front of that photo in a frame correct that is correct the two he never wore and you posted some words above that, correct? Yes. Can you read those? Judge, you, I want to object to the relevance of this. What is the relevance of yeah, this? it's going to waste. This jewelry, and I can bring him back up later, but these rings were at the house, and these rings this were... This is not about possession of the house. This is about, you're talking about personal property now. Well, personal property should be at that house. And that's personal property, real property. We're okay. talking about real property, not personal property. Okay. Um, any objection? All right, if I could approach. But you're not trying to get even with him just because you own the house to put uh, this kind of stuff on Facebook, are you? I'm, I'm doing that because he kicked his daughter out of the house in the, basically the same manner, no car, no vehicle, no resources. And I am supporting his daughter as well as his daughter is supporting me. And you're going to get even with him because of that? I have no reason to get even with him. Do the activities you're doing now? Correct? No, sir. I have no reason to get even with him. I simply want out of the marriage. I'm fine. Thank you, Judge. Are you direct? Do you think 90 days you can be out of the house and have a job? As long as I'm not tied up in investigations and courtrooms, yes, sir. Fair enough. No further questions. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. Mr. Baker, you want to call your next witness? That's our witnesses. I hear you improve in argument. Well, Judge, briefly, it's his house. We've established that. It's been his house for quite some time, him and his late wife's house. You see what's going on over there. The neighbors are. For all intents and purposes, terrified of what's going on next door. And that's not the way that Mr. Claiborne lived. That's not the way this should be going. And there's some reasoning for that. And hopefully we brought that about. But there is some waste going on. Hopefully we've shown that with these photographs. And Mr. Claiborne, again, this is his separate property. And he's entitled to get it back. We're not here on spousal support. There's been no motion filed. There's no notice opportunity to be heard on her with any spousal support. And have opportunity to bring in his income and expense statement. Uh, we've got plenty of time to do that. We obviously have an order of protection that we have to try, and we have to come in here for some sort of, uh, you know, division of marital debts, a spousal support argument for her, then so be it. Uh, but right now, she has the means to, to get out. She's got that Jeep. She's 
more or less already packed everything up, it sounds like, at this point. And uh, Mr. Claiborne needs his property back. He's homeless, and the business depends on him to be able to get into that house to, to make a living. He's got much more need for that house than she does at this point. Judge, the husband has left uh, the wife in a lurch here. You know, we've, we're roughly two weeks out from filing this, I think, this petition. You know, you couldn't even get notice on a detainer action by statute this quick. I think it requires 20 days to even get to a hearing on a detainer action. And the husband has now run into court. Ooh, I want to make my wife, who now I had to quit her job, I want to throw her out in the street with no income, no money, no place to live, and no means to support herself. Judge, I'd ask that uh, we be awarded temporary possession at least on a 90-day on a interval and we re revisit this if necessary until uh, she gets back on her feet. <clears throat> well, Mr. Baker brings up a detainer action and essentially that's where we are. This is a marriage of some five months. Uh, clearly the proof established without question or doubt that this property is a separate property of Mr. Claiborne Ms. Shortus has <clears throat> obtained various things in the way of like an order of protection, which is not before me. It was pointed out, and I certainly have examined this file numerous times this afternoon. There is only one thing before me, and that's possession of the house. Mr. Childress uh, is, I'm sorry, Mr. Claiborne is the owner of that property. It's acknowledged by Ms. Childress that it's his property. She acknowledges she doesn't want it. She's just asking for time to get out. In a detainer action, once the court determines that the owner of the property is entitled to possession, then uh, the occupant is given 10 days to remove themselves from the property. In this particular case, Mr. Claiborne not only is the owner of the property and has concerns about what's taking place in the, in the property itself, but also it is the uh, location of his business uh, activities that uh, is hampering his ability to operate his business. Based upon all the proof, this court is of the opinion that the temporary possession of the property should be given to Mr. Claiborne. She will have 10 days to vacate the property. There is no motion before me regarding support for her uh, or any other economic aspect of it. And it's only solely a possession and I'm treating it as a detainer action. And in General Sessions Court, it would be the same thing. She would have 10 days to vacate. So that 10 days is operating as of right now. Uh, effective starting tomorrow. In addition to that, the restraining order that's previously issued is modified to prevent her from removing any personal property that might be separate property of Mr. Claiborne uh, from damaging or destroying anything prior to her leaving. Mr. Baker, you have stood up. Well, Judge, if we're treating this as a detainer, I would let, let pass for at least 16 days since we're required 14 days notice on a hearing on a detainer. Well, I said I'm treating it. It is obviously not a detainer action, so it was a nice effort. But nonetheless, um, I'm sorry that she is in such a situation that it may call upon her to rely upon friends and so forth. And upon the filing of a motion for spousal support, uh, then certainly Judge Wallace can give you a hearing date and you can come back in before him on your order of protection or the spousal support and have that heard. He'll be here next this next month or this month? April. April is this month, so you probably should check with them. All right. May I address court? No. Thank you. What about? <laughs> well, I know we're going to ask this out in the hall, so tomorrow's day one. If I'm looking at that right, that would be the 14th uh, at lunch or 5. Ten days starts running tomorrow. And the weekend, and all that would be the 14th, so that would be... We need a time, 12 I'm assuming you two good lawyers can calculate 10 days without me having to do it for you. So First day is tomorrow. 10 days from tomorrow will be, tomorrow is the 5th. 10 days from tomorrow is the 15th. That's 10 days. 15th, yes sir. She has to be out by 6 p.m. on the 15th day of April. Yes sir, thank you judge. Right. Put it in order. I like pictures to go with my stories, so I snooped, and apparently this is what she looked like when they met. She looks a lot different now. 
This was on her older Instagram that had pictures of her Jeep when she first got it and things like that. So, I mean, I could see hit the attraction, but apparently it didn't last very long at all. And after the previous hearing, she had 10 days to get out of the house, which she did. But apparently she kind of took a lot of stuff with her and destroyed a lot of stuff. And in the time since the last hearing, nothing has really happened, but there has been a shit ton of motions filed. So we are back with Judge Wolf about eh, six months later, wait, four, five, six, four months later. And um, we are going to try and hear all of the motions that have been filed between the two of them. Oh, she shouldn't have a lawyer anymore. It gets good. This is hearing number three. Leaving Childress Claiborne. I have, I want to make sure of what we have um, pending before the court. So bear with me while I go through these motions and then we'll address them all. First of all, is on April the 19th of 2023, a motion for exclusive possession of a vehicle was filed by the respondent through her attorney at the time, Mr. Um, Olin Baker. <clears throat> I have a motion for pendaniliti support also filed April 19th, 2023 on behalf of Ms. Childress. I have a motion to compel and for sanctions filed May 18th of 2023 by Mr. Claiborne. A motion filed on May 24th uh, seeking to prohibit the uh, Respondent Ms. Childress Claiborne from continuing to post on social media negative inferences about him and his company. I have a motion for violation of the automatic injunction filed on May 24th by Mr. Childress. I'm sorry, Mr. Claiborne. I have a Motion for no contact order entered or filed May 24th by Mr. Cleburne. A motion for contempt filed June the 8th of 2023, filed by Mr. Cleburne, seeking to have uh, Mrs. Cleburne found in civil contempt. And lastly, according to what I am saying, is a motion filed by Mr. Claiborne for an order removing her, uh, Mrs. Claiborne, from the party automobile insurance. <coughs> have I missed any motion? You have two motions that you filed through your attorney prior to his withdrawal, and then the rest of these have been filed by Mr. Claiborne. Is that correct? Your Honor, that is correct. Um, there should also be one regarding a temporary order protection that was submitted into the courts on March 14th. Judge, that is a temporary order of protection. Now, that was in general sessions. It was on that day sent here to be heard. We never had a temporary hearing. Right. I would like some clarification to that today. That's not on the docket for today. I'm not necessarily prepared to get into any of that, but I think the TRO is expired because of the timeliness of the final hearing uh, when it gets transferred up. And I expressed that to Mr. Baker prior to his withdrawal and it never was said. So Your Honor, I, clarification maybe on that would be would be where I would be. Your Honor, this order of protection has been tossed back and forth in courtrooms. I've came to court every time expecting that the order of protection be heard. I've not been made aware that it was expired. I simply can't help if the court can't get it before a judge in time. Well, first and foremost, there is no order of protection. There is a petition for an order of protection that's pending, and we'll hear that today. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. And under those facts, um, 
it would appear that Mr. Claiborne is the plaintiff, so we're going to allow you to go forward with your motions first. And well, actually, I guess she filed hers contemporaneously, or at least time-wise, hers were filed first. So, Ms. Claiborne, you are representing yourself. If you'd like to come forward and you want to testify, yes, Your Honor, I would. And no disrespect, but I would like to state for the record, my legal name has always been Amy Childress. I've never changed it. There's never been any any indication that right. my name is Claiborne, and Mr. Holly is fully aware of that. Well, the petition that was filed for order of protection identifies you as Amy Lee Childress Claiborne. I don't know who filled it out, but it was not me. So the, I will address you as Miss Childress. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't think don't Mr. Do Claiborne say, has any problem with addressing her as Childress. I don't have any problem with that. I can tell you we've known her as Miss Claiborne. She did a will outside of my office and said her name was Miss Claiborne. So but whatever she wants to be called today is fine. I have a little preliminary motion before she begins to testify about the support motion. And that is the what I kind of talked to the court a little bit about earlier. And that's for my motion to compel it for sanctions, mainly because we've had this discovery outstanding since mid April. And that was when Mr. Baker was there as well. What is your, what is your discovery motion relate to? I don't have it. I filed it and I don't have any discovery. Nobody's ever responded no, to what, it. What are you? What information are you seeking in your motion for discovery that you feel like is relevant? In other words, what I'm trying to do is to identify what I can address in these motions today. And if you're saying that you have to have the answers to the interrogatories or your discovery before some of it has to be done, that's so be it. But for example, the petition for order of protection does not require discovery and normally there's no discovery made in that. So certainly we can go forward with that. The next question would be on all of these other motions, such as spousal support and so forth. Are you in saying that you must have your discovery responses before you're prepared to do that? What I am saying, Judge, is that, of course, I don't have it. The financial questions are in my discovery. I believe she has a job. She's asked for, I think, the Armada, which the Armada's uh, been sold. Uh, we're getting all that testimony, but the bottom line is, I think she has transportation, which I've asked about in the discovery. I think she has a job and an income, money in the bank. There's a lot of financial issues that goes with her motion for spousal support here today. I just don't think it's fair that we can sit on this for what, uh, that's now about four months. And if I had that, it would definitely streamline these motions today, I will say that. But long and short of it, I, I think it's only fair that I get the answers to my discovery which were due prior to the setting of this motion in the first place before we come in and, and you know, want the spouses. I'd like to have the answers to some of these questions so that I can prepare and, and put together a defense to this and know what I'm objecting to, what I'm going to allow, what the actual figures are going to be in some of this so that I can uh, put a decent defense in front of the court and not waste the court's time. Your Honor, if I may. You may. The interrogatories were entered as a response to the final or the divorce proceedings the emotions that were filed were to grant me spousal support and other aid that i might need until that time i did respond to the interrogatories to the or the discovery request to the best of my ability however a lot of these questions are either not relevant they're being sought to call out names of individuals who are continuing to be harassed through this court system with the information being obtained, as well as there are multiple criminal cases going on currently, and I do not wish to disclose that information until after the criminal trials have taken place. Well, you don't really have that right. Um, in a criminal case, the only person who has a right to avoid answering questions is a criminal defendant. The defendant has the right of, under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States to decline to answer questions that might tend to incriminate him in, in a criminal action. So you will have to answer those questions whether you wish to do so or not. And under the discovery rules and the rules of civil procedure, if you refuse to answer the questions, then it only gives me a couple of options. One of them is I can hold you in contempt, which I don't want to do. Another is that I can order that you have to pay the attorney's fees for the other side, which obviously you're probably not able to do. And a third one is, is I can dismiss your uh, pleadings in the case and that allows the other side to proceed on a default basis. 
none of those are, are good aspects for your um, side of this case. So I'm, I'm concerned that you need to understand you don't have the right to simply say because there's a pending criminal case that you're a victim or alleged victim in that you have the right to simply refuse to answer civil litigation questions. Um, <clears throat> you, at this point, um, have the right to proceed on your petition for order of protection. I am going to allow Mr. Uh, Holly to argue his motion for uh, to compel production of documents, if that's how you wish to proceed, and then we'll I'll decide where we are at that point. So on these other motions, Madam you want to come to the podium, and I'll hear you on your motion to compel. Hey, Judge, may I address the court too on that order for text? I'm just sitting here thinking. I wasn't prepared to do that. It, it there was no notice that today was going to be that hearing. I've got video basically of what what transpired during the entire domestic assault from the outside cameras of the parties. Um, and I don't have that with me here today. We played in general sessions in White Bluff. I think the court may want to want to see some of these things um, if we get into this order of protection here. And I would need it for a proper defense. But that order of protection, uh, of course, I know I never got any notice that it was going to be set actually for today. It has, there is no notice in the file about it. I'm just asking for a continuance so that I can, if we're going to do the order of protection, so I can put everything in front of the court. Well, it's not on the docket, and as a result, um, it, it's not a question of continuing. It's actually a question of setting it. If you're not prepared, then I cannot force you to go forward on it because it was not set. So uh, we'll have to find another day for that. Well, let's hear your motion to compel and uh, find out if there's any of these things that I can actually hear today. First of all, are all of these folks that are in the courtroom witnesses, or are they here with the rest of the folks that are here? Are they here on this case? I think uh, Your Honor, a I didn't see any of all of that, and I would ask for the rule for the witnesses to at least. Rule has been requested. That means that anyone who is going to be a potential witness in this case, other than the parties, must go outside of the courtroom and remain outside of the courtroom until you're called to testify. You are to not discuss the testimony of any other person. Uh, until you yourself have been called to testify. And your your honor, I would like to request to clear the courtroom. Um, this individual right here was my childhood best friend. She's been brought in here every time to intimidate me. I, it, you know, I would request to clear it. Don't have a right to clear the courtroom. We are a public proceeding, and as a result of that, uh, unless they're a witness, you don't have the right to. Anyone who's in this courtroom will conduct themselves appropriately. There'll be no in intimidation or attempt to intimidate, or I'll have them removed and held in contempt. Thank you, Your Honor. But I am simply telling you, you don't have a right to close a, a, a public proceeding. Thank you, Your Honor. Next thing is, is that I don't know if the monitors outside were on or off. Would you double check to make sure? I would double check, yeah. All right. Let's deal with your motion to compel. Well, Judge, as always, these are kind of simple. Uh, and my motion states the discovery was filed on the 10th day of April this year. Um, I sent an email to Olin Baker on the 21st day of April asking if the discovery was going to be uh, filed. He already talked about getting off of the case a little bit. I want to make sure I got a letter into him before he left if he was actually going to withdraw. And I do not have any answers. My standard discovery uh, ask all the financial basics of the other side. There, is there money in the bank? How much money do you have at your disposal? Do you have employment? What is your pay produced to me uh, in the request for production of documents, your pay stub, your tax returns, all of these things that would be beneficial to me trying to ascertain whether or not um, you know, she would have even a need for discovery or be able to handle the expenses herself for whatever her living condition is. Um, and I, I don't have any of that. And I don't think it's fair for that to wait for four months when this motion was outstanding since, or her motion I guess was outstanding uh, from what the court has said, the motion for pendant light support, I don't have the stamp filed copy, but it was signed by Mr. Baker on the 19th day of April, 2023, and certified to me on that day. And purposefully, we've had absolutely 
no attempt to answer these questions. Because there's none. If the court wants to see my discovery, it may take me a minute to dig it out of my bag over here. I'll be glad to do that. I don't have it on one There's a copy of it in the file. Is there? Okay, so I filed this one. I, I do some, and then with the Nancy Miller rule, sometimes I don't. But in this case, I did. And the court can very well look at that and see some of these questions would be definitely on point with whether or not she would be entitled to your spousal support. I don't know if she can't bring her motion, but I would just like to have an answer. Part of the sanctions and the motion to compel and sanctions would be that she provide me an answer to this prior to taking this up. Ms. Childress, you want to come to the podium? I'll hear you on why you should not, why you haven't answered these questions and why you should not. Yes, Your Honor. Again, at the time that these were filed, I did have a retainer in to Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker did forward these to me. I did respond to the best of my ability. Some of these questions in here are not relevant to a five month marriage. Or he's going back and asking things of all of my communication, social media, phones, you name it from the last 12 months. He's asking information pertaining to my father's estate, which has nothing to do with this marriage. I'm simply stating this is a five month marriage. There was no debt. There's no children involved. All I'm asking for is just the spousal support to get back on my feet in a divorce. There's no need to drag this out. I don't have the money to fight this. I truly don't. You see the number of motions that have been, that have came at me. I just simply don't have the money. I've tried to get a retainer in order to fight this. I don't have the funds. I just started working in May and I've had to purchase my own home. Since April, I was given 10 days to leave the marital residence. In that 10 days, I had to sleep on my stepdaughter's chair for several months, had to move again, finally got employment. And that money, it's every penny that I make is going to currently how I live and to pay people back. I, I simply don't have the money to fight this. I'm, I am prepared. Look, I, I'm prepared to sign papers, walk away, and cut our losses. The only option that I've been given by Mr. Claiborne is I can live in the marital residence for six months. He would pay all the expenses. However, he wanted me to lower the bond conditions or the order of protection. I do not wish to do that. I've even gone as far as I would walk away with nothing, as well as if he, if he would leave me alone, I would consider, consider going to the DA on this domestic, but it's just not stopping. I, I just simply want a divorce. We don't have any, we don't have any real estate together. We don't have any financials together. We lived for three months together. That was it. Well, a five month marriage, one of the factors that the court has to consider in any sort of spousal support request is the length and duration of the marriage. It also is the separate, assets that the parties have and the income that the parties have so all of these issues are relevant if we have to have a contested hearing if if you're telling me that you're wanting to just terminate your marriage and walk away uh you know count your losses or whatever i'll take a recess you and mr holly can talk about this case if y'all come to an agreement then so be it this is not a proceeding whereby we bargain criminal proceedings versus civil proceedings so i mean that's a decision you can make, but it's not part of what I condone as part of the situation. But the district attorney's office is readily available. And if you all negotiate something that you want to resolve so that you can done with Dixon County and can be on your way, then I'll certainly give you an opportunity to do that. So I'll take a short recess and let you and Mr. Holly talk about it and we'll come back to it. Otherwise, I'm going to have to order that there be an entry of an order regarding the discovery because it is going to have to be answered under oath. We'll stand and recess for about 15 minutes. Yes, Your Honor. All rise. You have argued your motion to compel, and there's no agreement reached between the two of you, so your motion to compel is granted. Ms. Uh, Childress will file her responses under oath, uh, making full and complete uh, answers to all of the questions are pursuant to the rules of civil procedure. She will file an objection. 
If you need to access the rules of civil procedure, you can do so online, I think, through the administrative officer of the courts. But you will either have to answer them fully under oath within 30 days or you will have to uh, file an objection and state the reason why you do not feel you should have to answer it. Then I will consider at a later date or one of the other judges will consider at a later date whether or not you're justified. If you are not justified and have failed to answer them despite my order, then sanctions will be applied. So be careful when you object to it to make sure that you have a valid legal reason to object or else it could come back to haunt you. Um, <clears throat> I've already uh, shown that the order of protection will have to be, there was an order of protection temporarily I issued in the in, uh, uh, general sessions and it was transferred, but under the law, that order was only valid for 15 days because it was issued ex parte. That means the petition is still pending, but there is no current order of protection in this court's opinion. Um, the issue of your request for attorney's fees on the motion to compel is reserved. Um, are there any other motions that you wish to address, Mr. Holly, before we adjourn? Judge. Seems to me that you can't have it both ways if you're asking for a, a continuance in order to obtain this information before you can proceed on some of them, then we'll be resetting everything. I, I understand that. Um, what I would say to that, as far as the motions that have been filed, first of all, it's a, it's a situation where I, I have trouble talking to Miss Childers. I just think we can't seem to communicate. So I'm having to file motions in a five month marriage. And that's just where we are with these folks. The motion for contempt for the dogs, a motion for contempt for the Armada. I'm going to pass those. We got the dogs back, we got the Armada back. Um, if, and a little bit here, the court entered an order April the 17th. And it was from a temporary hearing that we had. Mr. Baker was here. If you recall, there was a witness, a neighbor that got on the stand and testified about the pictures of the home. It's over there in White Bluff, the end of White Bluff, over by Craggy Hope. The court said you knew where it was. I don't know where it is. Went through the whole thing with her. You found her to be credible, found the pictures to be credible over objection, and uh, ordered that that Mr. Claiborne could have the home back. Mr. Baker and I had entered into an agreed order regarding a restraining order that, that we had filed, and we had an agreement. We had announced that agreement prior to the hearing. This court's ruling at the end of the day, you went back to our agreed order and said, I'm going to modify that just a little bit for you gentlemen. And I'm going to add a paragraph to the end of it that says that the wife is restrained from removing any of the personal property of the husband's from the husband's residence located at 5278 Highway 70 East White Bluff and or damaging and or destroying any of the personal property that might or is a separate property of the husband. So that was in place. We got the, the home back, not on that, that Saturday that the court anticipated. I didn't get the order, the ability to sign it for Mr. Baker until a little after four o'clock on Friday. So everybody's closed. White Bluff Municipal demanded an order before we could go in and, and hear, or go in and, and take possession of the home. So we came back Monday with the order, you, you signed it, and we went back in that Tuesday afternoon and took possession of the home. I, and, and an abundance of caution as contentious as this has been with her putting everything on social media you've seen the motions the what's attached to the motion for social media prohibitions and things of that nature um, we hired two off-duty police officers to go inspect the home first to get any liquor any guns out uh, the court has said that the temporary order of protection has expired however uh, there is uh, some recourse because he still has those domestic bond conditions we have uh, adamantly oppose that domestic. It's currently set for trial. Uh, and uh, Judge Creasy is representing him on that. But what happened when we got the ability to go in the home on that Tuesday, it's been cleaned out. There's all sorts of damage. You're going to hear and see photographs of white powdery substance in the gas tank of the New Harley. Water in the gas tank of the side-by-side. -side. Somebody defecated in his clothes drawer. There's urination stains all over the place. There's a whole list of things, TVs, uh, jewelry. We've got about $8,000 worth of jewelry that is missing. We have seen this on different sale sites on the internet right now. 
Um, I fear that if we don't at least be able to have heard the motion for contempt for the stolen damage in personal property, some 42, we're estimating that to be by our list that's attached to the motion, some $42,000 worth of, of personal property and damages, uh, and the personal property will be just that much further out of reach. Um, so that's a fairly important motion for Mr. Claiborne at this point, whether it's today or a quick reset. Um, but I, the, the two officers are here to testify about what they found, the condition of the home when they first went in. Then they went in, inspected it. There was some alcohol in there, which they got out and gave to uh, a, a neighbor friend. Uh, there were no weapons in there, so they cleared it for him. And then he came in and, and took it over. They're here to testify. And we've had to pay them because they are privately, they're off duty. They're privately hired. And uh, they've, they've been here on both, both days. It's a little expense to Mr. Claiborne to be able to do that. I just feel like this one, particularly this one motion, um, needs needs some attention soon. I'll put it that way to the court. I understand the court's reasoning of what you're saying. I'd like to be able to do it today, or at least be able to put the officers on, so we don't have to pay them anymore. If that's a consideration, the posting on social media, the uh, the no contact, that should be a relatively simple motion. I mean, if we're going to hear that, I stand on basically what I filed. I mean, I put all the social media posts that's attached. I don't think it's hard to say that you know both parties would not have any contact, or both parties would. Uh, you know, not put anything on social media, that sort of thing. Um, but I, we're, we're concerned about the personal property, and it's just a, such a. And if the court will remember it, it kind of the photographs resembled something going on in the Animal House movie over there. And I just, um, and Mr. Claiborne does as well. Uh, you know, wants some sort of relief for this personal property, or at least figure out maybe what she's going to say where it is, or if we can get our hands on any of it. To preserve it I, that's the divorce case it's a five-month marriage they don't have anything else but that particular motion right there is pretty much our divorce case in full Ms. Childress yes your honor I did attempt to speak with Mr. Holly he basically held a piece of paper in my face and said Where's my hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff I don't care about okay. that okay. Just tell me are you I am prepared, prepared to speak to the theft and damages today. I have video myself, I have witnesses, and I have receipts for everything. All right, then we'll hear that. Yes, Your Honor. And I would also like to hear on the no contact, I would like to hear that as well as he had brought up another, itch, um, he had filed a motion on accessing um, email accounts previously. He filed another motion against me again. I've turned over that email address. However, I never received any of my account information, and I would like to hear that motion as well today. We will hear um, every motion that both sides agree can be heard. So, yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Holly, you may call your first witness. This will start with the motion that you filed for contempt on civil contempt on June the 8th of 2023, correct? Yes, sir. Bye. Right. Hunter Angle, he's out in the hallway. You will step around here, please, and place our clerk and raise your right hand. Yes, Mr. Anglin, state your full name for the court, please, sir. Hunter Anglin. And are you employed with the Dixon County Sheriff's Department? Yes, sir. You have a chance to do some off duty off duty work for Mr. Claiborne? Uh yes, sir. Do you have a chance to go out and do a civil standby for him? I he was trying to get his home back? Uh yes, sir. And was that and what date was that? The first time we went was on 4-15-23. Okay. Tell the court what happened that time. On the first civil standby, pretty and much. And I just say that that was a Saturday, right? Uh it was, it yes, was. sir. Okay, go ahead. The first time we went for the civil standby, it was due to a recent court appearance where uh, Judge Wolf had signed off that he could have possession of the property back. 
my whole purpose for being there the whole time was just to check the house for firearms and alcohol and that was it uh, the first time we went we got canceled because i realized there wasn't a signed copy by judge wolf um so i actually ended up canceling the civil standby that day and was white bluff municipal court demanding that as well um from what i've gathered uh former officer jeremy duke had spoke with white bluff or been in contact with them and white bluff actually drove by and i said without the signed paper i'm not going to do it so uh okay. the first day we left all right and then you came back then that following tuesday and we had a judge sign that filed order that said you could or he could mr claver could take back the home oh uh, yes sir that was at 12 p.m okay and explain to the court how you found the house when you went in um how i found the house i'd never been there before um so pretty much when i went we left mr claiborne outside um sergeant lashley was already on scene um i did observe him carrying out some alcohol bottles because that was the whole purpose of us being there was to get the firearms and alcohol out so he would be in accordance with his bond conditions um after that we went through the house i did notice a few things uh and after we realized that we got everything, we just wanted to double check. So we actually got Mr. Claiborne to come in with us and walk through. But I can't say how the house ever was before because I, I didn't know either party. I'm just asking how you found the house when you went in. Was it? <sighs> it was it was fairly empty, honestly. There was furniture. Um, there were big trash bags, I believe, in the kitchen that had leftover crab. And it, it, it really made the house stink up. If you got near the kitchen, you knew it. Uh, items were in disarray i walked through like i said just to make sure because we wanted to make sure he was in accordance um, i did observe his harley in the basement um, it had what looked like powdered sugar or something around the gas tank but like i said i'd never seen it prior mm -hmm. couldn't say what the substance was uh, but anything after that if you're asking the house was it, it kind of looked like a newly modeled house really <laughs> like there it was empty okay and as far as uh, you entering the home, are you saying you entered it before Mr. Claiborne went in? Uh, yes, sir, I did. Okay. Was, did Mr. Claiborne have any opportunity to sabotage this house to make it look like that? I was there on the 15th, and of course I left. I didn't sit there the whole time. But uh, no, not on that day because we had left him outside specifically, so he was not in violation of his bond conditions. Mm -hmm. All right. And did you have an opportunity to serve one of the witnesses here today? I did. Which one? Uh, Mr. Colin Dever. Okay. When you served him, uh, what did he tell you about Ms. Childers? Uh, he was very cordial. Uh, Mr. Dever was very polite. Uh, when he opened the door, I think he was a little bit shocked uh, to see me there. Uh, and I handed him the paper and I said, Mr. Devers, you've been served. And he said, is this about that bitch, Amy? And I said, sir, I, I, I don't know, Amy. I'm, I'm, you'll have to read the paperwork. Your Honor, I'd object. Mr. Collin is outside. If we could ask him those questions directly. We absolutely uh, can. Objections based on the hearsay statement. I sustain the objection. So, <coughs> that's all I have. Thank you. Do you have any questions for this witness? I do, Your Honor. Come to the podium. Deputy Anglin, can you, yes, tell, can you tell me what time you arrived at the house on 4.15? On 4.15, it would have been after 6, ma'am. Um, it was roughly, I know I was passing Montgomery Bell. I went back on my text messages at 5.50ish, uh, but I wasn't supposed to be there until 6. And like I said, I'd never met either party involved in this. I was only there just to make sure there weren't guns there. Gotcha. Can you specifically speak to the damages that you're, I mean, this list is pretty big and you said the house was pretty empty, so. I, I never made a list of anything. Uh, I, like I told you, uh, or uh, Attorney Holly on that, I never knew what the house looked like before. I didn't know either of y'all. But there, I guess we're, let me restate it. Um, these two deputies, you've been one of them. Yes, that was hired, is testifying to close to hundred thousand dollars worth of damages and items being missing you stated that the house was I never, pretty much empty. Yeah, I have no that knowledge wasn't part of my questioning and wasn't part of of his answers to that there's um there's no way he would even know that did you state that the house looked 
empty when you went through it? It, it honestly, uh, Miss Amy, it looked kind of like a house that was up for sale, really, because there, I mean, there was things kind of moved, but most of the cabinets were empty. It's like it had been like cleaned out. Did you interact with Officer Matt Ray with White Bluff Police Department on 415? I don't know that name, ma'am. Did you say Matt Ray? Yes, sir. Who never heard of Officer him. Ray with White Bluff Police Department? I've never heard of an Officer Ray. Okay. Um. So, what other day did you go back into the house? Um. Are you talking about the first time? I didn't go in the house on the fifteenth. Uh, the second time. The second time that was the eighteenth, ma'am. On the eighteenth, about what time? Um. We were scheduled to be there at twelve. I looked back on my text. Is that a well to be as well to be specific? Uh, I was passing in relation the backside of Montgomery Bell just before twelve. So I'm assuming I got there around twelve ten, probably. Okay. And so, if I'm understanding this correctly, Mr. Claver never entered the home on four fifteen, correct? That would be a question. He did or go in after myself and sergeant lashley had already went in so after y'all had ex exited the home, sergeant right? lashley was actually inside once i arrived at 1208 1210 in that area and he was carrying out uh liquor bottles and giving them to i guess one of mr claiborne's family members and that's on the 18th yes ma'am on the 15th did anyone specifically go into no the one entered the house uh we did get a complaint about a a dog possibly being in there uh, no one went in the house at all on the 15th and i made sure of that because i i did believe uh attorney holly that he said that uh the honorable judge wolf had signed off on it but or, or not signed off on it but he had ordered he could but without something doing my job for as long as i have i'm not going to go in unless i see it on paper um are you a client of mr holly's i have been in the past so that, that that would be your relationship with Mr. Holly? No, no, that's not correct. I've been friends with uh, Judge Holly, Attorney Holly, for uh, 20 years. But you are a client, correct? I wouldn't call myself a current client. My case is... According to the news media, you are. Uh, at Holly. one point, it was. Check to the relevant. You're kind of going it's, out It's there. relevant to state... The... You need to address me rather than him. He's objecting to the relevant. Sorry, Your Honor. Um, it's relevant because... If Mr. Anglin was hired by Mr. Claiborne as his personal deputy to go inside this house, I know the two deputies involved in this case are personally directly um, connected to Mr. Holly, and there is relevance there. Um, so I would request to allow it. How does it make relevance? Means that you know, something, a piece of evidence that makes an issue more likely to be true than not. That's why it's relevant. What issue are you trying to say? It makes it relevant that he was a former client or a friend or whatever of Mr. Holly. Because of the law enforcement involvement, Your Honor. Sustain the objection. Um, were you reprimanded by Lieutenant Humphreys or by your... Um, oh, absolutely not. Said? They looked at the complaint and said they were frivolous. Okay, so... Your complaint. So Lieutenant Humphrey's text message to me would be... Yours was frivolous. Okay, I have a text message from Lieutenant Humphrey's that... Judge, I'm going to object to the hearsay of that. Oh, it's one. not. Sorry. You cannot... Your job right now is to question, not to make statements or offer evidence. So you can ask questions of this witness, but you cannot state facts as you believe them to be. So sustain the objection. So you were not reprimanded? Correct? Oh, no, not at all. No further questions. I was told to have a great day. Anything further? The door is open. Uh, Ms. Childress did file a complaint against you for this civil standby, correct? I've never met the woman. Well, I mean, she did file a complaint oh, she, against you. She did. And what was, what, um, what was the result? Excuse me. What, what did you go through in the process of that with the Sheriff's Administration? Oh, about a full support from them, about a 10 minute meeting, and they figured out it was frivolous. And they took what action, if any, toward her Nothing. complaint? Told me to have a good day. Thank you. Your Honor. If the court will allow it, I have my cell phone out of my vehicle where Lieutenant Humphreys is, in fact, confirming that there was 
reprimands involved. He's asking to get in some hearsay. Well, Mr. Hawley, you went there with it. I mean, you're you're the one that said that I that I made these motions against or these complaints against him, and I do have the evidence that it's it's not frivolous. Well, I one, got promoted to sergeant. Everybody, stop talking except me and listen to me. Number one, any out of court statement you have in the form of a text message is considered to be hearsay and would therefore not be admissible. If you want to subpoena the person that supposedly made that statement, then you can bring them into court and have them testify. But I will not allow you to bring in a text message from another person who's not subject to being cross-examined here in the courtroom and have that brought in to disprove or to prove a fact. So I'm sustaining the objection on the basis of, of uh, it is hearsay. Yes, Your Honor. And she was, Lieutenant Humphreys is out on medical this week and she was not allowed to be here. So if I need to have her subpoenaed at a later time, I will. Your call, I'm just simply saying your, your, your uh, text message is not admissible. Yes, Your Honor. Any further? Thank you, officer. You may stand down. Thank you, Judge. You are released from your subpoena. You may go about your business. Call your next witness. Chris Lash. Um, Mr. Angle was asking if he could stay in the courtroom and watch. I, I Public proceedings, and you may stay as long as you like. Thank you. Don't call Thank you. Come up, sir, and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth will help you God. Brother. You will, for the record, state your name, sir. Christopher Stanley Lashley. And uh, what is your employment? My employment, I'm a Dixie County Sheriff's Patrol Sergeant. Did you have an opportunity to go to the home of Mr. Claiborne off duty as being employed by Mr. Claiborne to do a civil standby? Yes, sir, I did. And that was on a private basis, correct? Yes, sir. And you went there on a Saturday, I believe it was the 15th of April, somewhere around in there? Yes, sir. And tell the court what happened on that day. Well, we got up there, got a copy of, we were supposed to go in there, make sure there wasn't any guns or alcohol in the residence. And that was because of the violation, possible violation of bond conditions? Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. And uh, so we got up there and we're looking at the order and the order wasn't signed. We had to terminate it. We could not go in. Did White Bluff Municipal Court ask for the order before you could go in? They did. All right. And they're the ones that said without a signed order, they're not going to allow that at that time. That's correct. Do you have any doubt that if Mr. Kleber would have went there on Saturday without a signed order, that that would have been an altercation between him and the White Bluff Municipal Department? I'm positive it would have been a violation without the judge's signature or attorney's signatures. And then you had an opportunity to go on that following Tuesday, correct? Yes, sir, I did. All right, and explain to the court again what happened when you got there and get into how you found the house and that uh, that, that sort of thing. On the 18th, um, how I found the house, I had served a subpoena there before. I mean, like the condition of the house, how you found the condition of the house. Oh, okay. Well, the house, it, it was vacant. Um, nobody was there, empty. Uh, we were concerned about pets being in the house. There were no pets in the house. Um, the house was, it, it was stripped down. It's like most of the stuff gone out from out of it, except for the shop area from what I could tell. Kitchen was a wreck. Um, How so? It, it was just trash everywhere. There was stuff in the trash can that was, it was like food put in there and it was, it was just a rotten smell to it. Um, after that, you know, we walked around and removed any alcohol that was in the residence, did not see any firearms in there. And then I had, uh, Deputy Angler, Sergeant Angler at the time, that's what I call him. But he come in there after me and, you know, I had him do another walkthrough with me. After that, we went out to the driveway and got Mr. Claver and 
allowed him to walk through to make sure everything's good because we took out everything we could find. Everything you could find being alcohol or gun related? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and based on this, has Ms. Childress, so we got into it earlier, has she filed any complaints against you with the Sheriff's Department? That is correct. What was the basis of those complaints? basis of the complaints was um, where I had met up with her. I had went on duty and served one of the papers on her because off duty, she would not answer the phone or Officer Lewis, if it's hard to lose, pull that base of that microphone closer to you. You can lean back as long as that's a little bit close. There you go. Sorry, Judge. That's all right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What was the outcome of that investigation with the Sheriff's Department? The outcome, um, it, there was no policy violation, but the ethics part of it, I was told that I cannot serve anything while on duty anymore. So, have you had an opportunity now that uh, this is all going by? Well, let's try that. Is there anything else that's come about this in the last couple of days? Uh, that's correct. I, I was informed that. Uh, as one of the news stations wanted a copy of mine and Hunter England's work file or a personnel file. Okay. Somebody complained to the news and yes. All right. Nothing further. Ms. Jules, you have questions for this witness? Yes, Ron. <clears throat> Mr. Lashley, what time did you arrive at the residence on the 18th? On the 18th. It's somewhere around noon, maybe a little after. Okay. According to Mr. Holly's motion, there were drug needles. There were there was people defecated in the house. Supposedly, um, there were prescriptions missing. Did anyone take any DNA or take any pictures? Uh, I don't recall any of that. So, a hundred thousand dollars worth of vandalism and items missing and. Defecation. I don't object to the relevance of $100,000. I, I don't believe I ever said that. The, the list is attached to the motion. It's around $42,000. Um, sustained as to the form of the question, you may rephrase. Sorry, I misunderstood Mr. Holly on the hall. $42,000 worth of items. Any pictures taken? No, that's not what I was there for. Was there a report taken? Any type of report, any type of statement? Not that I recall. So you're just here testifying on what you observed? No pictures, no DNA, nothing, right? I was there on personal, hired out personally. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. Holly? Nothing else. Thank you, Sergeant. You may step down and you may leave or you may stay as you choose. Call your next witness. Mr. Clayton. You're Chris Claiborne, correct? Yes, sir. And you've heard the officers, or the off-duty officers at the time testify about you getting the home back on April the 18th. Yes, sir. Is everything that they testified to accurate? Yes, sir. Yeah. And when you got into the home, there was no alcohol, no guns or firearms or anything of that nature, correct? No, sir. There, uh there was very few uh, bottles of the alcohol that was left at the home out of the collection that, that I had collected over the years. And then the firearms were, were missing from the home, three of them, three pistols. And um, because you have bond conditions on the domestic, you're not to be in possession of alcohol or firearms, correct? Correct. correct. And you were concerned if you went to the home that it would be in the home and you might get in trouble. Yes, sir. That's why they were sent in to, to retrieve the items first before I come onto the property. 
Um, and you understand today that that we have filed this motion for contempt for stolen damaged personal property. Yes, sir. And overall, when you got the home back, how long did it take you to go through the home and to see what was missing, damaged, I mean, stolen? You know, me and her, the home was mine prior to the marriage and it was mine and my late wife's home. We was together for 20, 20 something years. So, I mean, there was, you know, you just, it's a lot to go through a 20 year marriage of stuff. and. So I mean, it took me weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Like even since this has been filed, I've still found come across odd and end things that that I'm missing still. Like another Yeti killer that I forgot. Like a long green zip up when I'm there. Still stuff I'm finding missing today. Uh, so I mean, you, it, yeah, it's. I mean, I've like like it took me a month almost to go through this house. I mean, cause, you know, we have all kinds of totes in the attic, and you know, there's all kinds of stuff for a business that's tied into it. I had to get back and find business receipts because when I went back into the home, all, a lot of the stuff in the garage had been put in boxes uh, that belonged to like parts for work and stuff and this and that, you know, I'm trying to re figure out what, what I had and what was missing, uh, all kinds of just different things. And to be clear, uh, refresh the judge's memory a little bit, you have a forklift repair. Yes, sir, I'm, sir I'm, on, I'm on my own business. C and K forklift. Yes, sir, me and, my late, well, my, me and my late wife started it together. That's the C and the K, Chris yes, sir. Kim, correct? Yes. And you repair forklifts. Yes, sir. And you do that primarily out of your home? Out of my home. I, I, I keep all the parts and stuff stocked out of my garage and stuff at the home. Okay. Uh, and I know we've got some photographs of this we're going to get to. Did you, and you heard uh, Deputy Anglin talk about a white powdery substance in the Harley Davidson. Yeah. You, you had a Harley Davidson? Yes, it's a brand new, that, it's bought in 2019. When I first entered the home that day, when I pulled onto the property, Everybody it was, was, it was a 2019 Harley? Yes, 2019, yes. Okay. Yeah. And it was there when you got dispossessed of the home on this domestic charge, correct? Yes, sir. And was there a white powdery substance around the gas tank when you left? No, sir. I had just, no, I had I'd been riding the bike, I think, before then or something. I'd been in the garage because I had moved it around because I had to the side by side. Had some work done, didn't brought it back. When you got back into the home and you know, noticed that, describe it to the court what you saw. Uh, me and uh, the deputy and, and some else was all kind of standing in the garage and leaning over the bike. I started looking at the bike, opening up the saddlebags and stuff, and I said, the keys were gone to the bike. I always kept them down in, in, in one of the saddlebags on the bike, and I just sat there and I flopped the gas tank open and turned the, 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 popped the, the top up off the gas tank. Hey, pull that microphone oh, closer to sorry. you. Just, you can stand back, but just pull yeah. the base of it closer. There you go. I pulled the... Um, uh, the, the lid up where the gas cap is and I said like something white I screwed the gas cap off of it and then when I did uh, it was just there was white powder everywhere down like somebody put white powder down in the gas tank because it was all around the gas cap and everything on it. Did you uh, drain the gas? Uh, we we got the side of the cock loose on the bottom of the tank and got got some of the gas out to kind of see what it was and then a day or two later, I went back and I had to pull the complete tank all the way off the bike and drain everything and flush the tank out. And what did you find in the gas tank in the side by side? Uh, water, because when I had got back to the house, there was no keys or nothing. All the keys were gone. We actually found one key hanging up in the kitchen to the side by side. So right before um, I had got removed from the house, um, I had just took the side by side down to America's Motorsports and had a lift kit put on it. And uh, and and I, when I parked it back in the garage, it was set completely on empty because it hadn't been rowed. So when I found the key, I went downstairs and I pushed the power button on it. And when I pushed the power button on it, it went straight over to full. So I cut it back off real quick because I knew something had to be wrong because I had not put no gas or nothing in the side by side. So then I had popped open the, uh, the glove box and stuff on that and noticed there was stuff missing out of the glove box of it and there was another insurance card inside there. Did you find water in the gas tank? We did. We drained the gas tank on it, and it was pretty much about 90, 90, 95 percent water in the gas tank. The defecation in the drawer, can you describe that to me? It was on, uh, when we took some of my clothes, it was up there, I had set them, some, some of my clothes, which had been put in bags. I guess she bagged a lot of my stuff up, and it was set a lot, some, and so we put some of the stuff up there on top of the dresser, and in my bedroom, my dresser sets on uh, um, pads, so if you scoot it, it won't scratch the hardwood floors. So I had scooted, I had so stuff burned, some stuff had fell behind the dresser, and when I slid the dresser out, uh, some of the drawers had come open, and, it, and I kneeled down to get stuff, and I looked up, 
and there was something smeared underneath the bottom of the two top drawers on it. And I got to look and I scratched something. Somebody, it was some kind of feces had been put underneath the bottom edges of the drawers. What about it, the urination in the bed? Can you describe that to the court? I'm sorry, what, sir? The urination on your bed? Uh, we went in one of the guest bedrooms uh, when I had entered the home. It had a comforter through over the bed, and I pulled it back, and no, there wasn't no sheet on the bed. It was just a comforter on the bed. And so whenever I pulled the comforter all the way back, it was a pea stain all the way around the bed. I mean, the whole size, the size of the bed, like somebody just had peed all the way over the whole entire bed. And, and just still a, a comforter back over the top of it with no sheet or nothing. How did you find the uh, hot tub? Uh, it looked like somebody had had a wild party in it. There was beer, beer bottle caps on it. Like, that. like somebody had puked all in it. And there's, there was just puke or something, or some kind of puke looking thing all in it. All it was all stocked up. Uh, I've spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars trying to get the hot tub back in the right shape, uh, trying to get it fixed back. Did you find any like drug needles at the home? I did. When uh, we was over there, there was trash that had been there. There was probably about six or seven, eight bags of trash. It was put on one of my trailers that sits outside. And then there was about I don't know, six or seven, eight bags of trash on the back porch when we first got there. Uh, we was going through some of the stuff and then one of the bags that we opened up that was outside, uh, there was a needle in it. Um, and then and then when everybody kind of got clear, we kind of got going through the things and we started pulling all the stuff out of the trash bags. Uh, there was a bunch of needles in it that was uncapped. There was a bunch of needles that was inside water bottles uh, that didn't have caps on them. Uh, so I mean, and it was none of my trash because that was none of my trash bags or trash. It was because I hadn't been in the house in months. Judge, if we could have the, um, we got some photographs of these things from the court. If we could have them connected to the HDMI. I think I've got plugged in. Cox, oh, would you hit the light? So let's go over some of these photographs, Mr. Claiborne, and I'll ask you some questions about them. Mm -hmm. Mainly if you can identify the photograph, what it is for. And let me ask you this real quick. You've, you've put together a list that we've attached to the motion yes, sir. of all the items with a dollar value beside them. Yes, sir. And some of the, a lot of that stuff I still have the receipts for too. Or I was able to retrieve the seats from the stores that I had bought and some of the model serial numbers as well. Okay. So what are we looking at here? Uh, that's a picture prior to me moving out of or getting, me going out of the home. As you can see, the big screen TV that's hanging up on the wall with a sound bar mounted to the top of it. Admittedly, some of these photographs you had to go back and pull these photographs it's from the old, time before you got displaced, correct? Yes, sir. We, I went back over my old phone or back old pictures of my my late wife's social media, where she had posted some pictures on Facebook and you know or something or other to find some item in the house that was missing or some of my old, my old social media posts, you know, that would show items in the house for picture was took or something. All right. So, I mean, this is not just a square on picture of the television, but that's why. Yeah, correct. yeah, that's, that, that's showing the TV was there at the house. All right, and then... That's another bit the picture of the same. I think it's a 55 inch it hung on the wall in the bedroom. Okay. And then, what's that a picture of? That's where the TV was, was took off from the wall and they whenever they took the TV off the wall, the cable box that was that was that was mounted to the TV was neatly folded up and put in the kitchen cabinet. And this was a TV again. I want to make sure you you brought this into the marriage with you. Yes, sir. I bought that prior to the marriage, sir. And you actually have the receipt for the for the television. Yes, sir. Right? I, did. I bought the TV, and then I went back later and I bought the sound the sound bar and stuff uh, a little bit later on. And the television value here is eight hundred and one dollars and whatever fourteen cents. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. And you still to this day, where where do you know the TV is at this point? It's missing. I mean, I, don't, I have no idea. It wasn't there when I returned to the home. Okay. And then talk about the sound bar. We don't have any pictures of the actual sound bar, do we? It was on. It was on that one picture of the TV. It was mounted at the top. It's black. It matched the TV. I think on the first picture that you shown. Not that one, the first picture. It should have been up there. Maybe you can see, you can see the top of the sound bar where it's mounted to the top. It's how Denton's come out and mounted it up there. 
Okay. Yes, sir. And the sound bar, was it there when you got your home back? No, sir. It was you, the sound bars there. Then if you look in the picture where there's a little table underneath that mirror right there, you can see the top of a subwoofer that should be sitting in the floor right there that goes along with the sound bar, the sound bar uh, subwoofer combo. Okay. And uh, your value for that, according to your estimate, is six fifty five sixty. Yes, sir. With the receipt, with the original receipt set. Okay. And that's the receipt for the sound bar. It is, sir. So I went back to Denton's and had them pull the receipts. Talk about your late wife's jewelry box with jewelry. What what all was in there? Um. Should have been some earrings in there. There should have been uh, maybe uh, over the broken bracelet that was in there, uh, and then all kinds of other, like a little other necklaces and stuff. Uh, uh, our, our mine and mine and her or my wedding band that I wore with her was in there, and then I had another wedding band. I had two wedding bands with, with Miss Childress. I had a plastic one that I like a rubber one that I wore when I worked all the time, so I wouldn't get. I had a black titanium one, and it was in that jewelry box as well. Um, and so then, then I saw the other all the odd end jewelry that my my late wife had in there. It was some earrings and other stuff like that and and whatnot. It's one of the things you didn't put a value on your list. Well, no, because I don't because some of the stuff you know I still haven't got receipts in case for uh, some of the stuff I can't I couldn't really put a value on it. But then her wedding band that she actually wore her diamond ring was I have a separate jewelry box that I kept in, in the bathroom on the counter that I kept two of my watches in and I kept her wedding band in there and her, her wedding band and wedding ring in there. And then when I returned to the home that one of the watches were gone and then her wedding band and wedding ring was gone. And, and that ring today is probably worth over five or six thousand dollars, if not more. That's a picture of the ring there. That's the picture of the ring. It's got, I think, 20 some 20 something diamonds in it. Uh, I remember when we bought it 20 years ago, we, we paid quite a bit for it. It's probably, it could be worth up to $10,000 today, if even more. And then that's one of the, that's my jewelry box. That's where the ring was, was supposed to have been kept. Uh, and then it was in a little white bag, like a little pull string bag that I kept in there, along with another watch that she had bought me, because she had bought me that Harley Davidson watch and an older watch that she had bought me years ago. And was the uh, engagement ring, it wasn't there when no, you got that? No, that, that and her wedding band was gone too. Both the rings were gone. Do you have any idea today where they are? Sorry, do what? Do you have any idea today where they are at all? I do not know, sir. I do not know where they're at, no. And your wife, ex, your late wife passed away at COVID. Yes, sir, she did. Fresh the judge's memory. Yes, sir, she did. Yes, sir. You guys are both in the hospital at the same time with COVID. Yes, sir. They, right? they expected both of us to pass away. Um, she she passed away uh, on a Friday night, and then they was and then they kept telling me they didn't know if I was going to make it or not. They kept trying to put me on a ventilator as well, and luckily I, I, I wasn't I was I didn't have to go on one. Explain that picture to the court. What is that a picture of? That's the uh, the top section of the jury box. And then there's like the upper section, and then the un underneath section was showing where the other watch was. That you pull that little tray out. It's like a two like a two story jury box. That was the one that I purchased after she passed away. For brevity's sake, you've got on your list a gold wedding band, a man's watch. Both of those were, is it your testimony, both of those were in the home when you were displaced and they're not there now? No, they're not, sir. They're not, no. And sitting here today, do you know what happened to no, them? No, sir, I do not. And is your value $150, $250 accurate as to what you value this personal property of yours at? The watch? Something like that. It's an older watch she had bought me. She bought it in one of the jewelry stores back years ago, and I, that's probably about what we paid for it years ago. May I give this to Mr. Claver, and I'm going to enter it into evidence. This being what? The list. I think it might help him to look at the list as we're going through this. I'm going to try to speed this up. We got a lot of property to get through, and you got your gold wedding band and the men's watch at one fifty and two fifty collectively, correct? That's because there was a smaller, there were smaller bands just on those. Okay. Um, and then you've got a men's gold rope necklaces. You had two of those, correct? Yes, my late wife had purchased those before for me before for gifts before she had passed away. And is this a fair and accurate depiction of 
Yes, sir. That's those. one of them there. And actually, I believe if you zoom in on the far right of that picture, you can actually see her wedding, her wedding ring, the little the little round like ring she wore, the wedding band part of it. I kept I wore it around my neck after she passed away. I kept it on that chain right there. Right there. See, yes, sir. Yeah. And you recall when this picture was this is a valuable piece of merchandise. That, that picture right there was, was took right after not too long after she passed away, right when I actually was able to start getting back up and getting out of the house again and start doing things. And when was that? The court doesn't know that. Um, well, I mean, yeah. ballpark she, figure. I mean, I'm she passed that. away in August. That picture right there may have been taken probably uh, late September, maybe something like that, of, of two years ago. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, I would probably say late September, end of September, maybe somewhere around there. Because when I come home from the hospital, it was a month almost before I was able, actually able to get up and do a lot. And again, this is a fair and accurate depiction of those two necklaces that you're asking. Yeah, because that, that's University. actually her. That's actually her jewelry box that's missing from the house, still sitting there because I had not purchased the other one yet. Sitting here today, do you know where that necklace is at all? No, sir. I do not. All right. So. You also have a receipt for the purchase of the necklace, correct? Yes, sir. That's the receipt of one of them. I was actually able to go back to, I believe, K Jewelers and get. And this is one of the necklaces, correct? It, it is, yes, sir. All right. And the retail is $3,500, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this next document is a receipt from Southern Gun and Palm with Miss Childers name on it. Yes, sir. She, Explain that to the court. Um, I How was, did you get that? Uh, when, I, when I got possession of the home back, that was hanging on the uh, refrigerator uh, along with some other stuff that they had left up there for me, some other cards and whatnot, making fun of me basically, uh, that, um, that, my, that my wife's jewelry that she had purchased me uh, was at, at a pawn shop. Did you check at the pawn shop? Uh, well, I did, and then uh, they said it was still there, but they could not go into much detail for, from me because I was not the one that per, per se pawned it, but I could come and pick it up since I had the, the receipt for it, I believe. I believe that's the accurate description of what they said, I believe. And you and I discussed this with a detective, did we not? Yes, sir, we did. And was there any relief there at all? No, sir, there was not. They were told it was civil, and we had to come to civil court and yeah, deal with it. Let the judge deal with it in, in civil court. I'm sorry, repeat that. He what said that uh, he said that uh, was, he would not deal with it. That it was pretty much the judge would need to deal with it in civil court. So did you ever recover these items? No, sir. I have not to this day not been able to get them back. And that you know those are what my late wife purchased me right before she passed away. Detective Martin's out there. I subpoenaed him to, if we need him to explain that. This is why I'm here. We can't get relief except for a, a civil action, apparently. Um, so, all right, change jar. Is this a fair and accurate depiction of your change jar? Yes, sir, it was. It, it probably had around $500 between uh, cash and coins and everything, whatever, because I'd always, I don't carry a lot of cash on me, and anybody can, can verify that. I, that it, I always just, if I get anything back, I always throw it in that jar because I save it for vacation money or whatever. If I want to buy something at one time, I've got just cash money there. I can go in and get, get the cash out. Is this how you found the change jar when you got yeah. your home back? Yeah. It and do you have any idea about how much change you had in there? Probably about five hundred dollars. Between the cash it would be in it and the change, it would probably have been about five hundred dollars. I'm always throwing a ten or a twenty or whatever in it, whatever I have back from something. And did you have it before the marriage? Yes, sir, I did. I've had that for you. Me and my late that goes back to my kids when they was all little. You in know. your testimony today, you had that value of five hundred dollars in it before the marriage. Yes, sir, probably so. With Miss Childers. Yes, sir. It was probably more than that because I mean, I was in and out of the house throwing money in it all the time. The next thing on your list, and you have it there at number nine, the iPads. Describe that to the court. Um, what is that? One of them is my work iPad that I used uh, for work. Uh, and then the other one was my, it was my, it's it's kind of a complicated one. And it's technically my iPad, but my daughter had went and got it on, on, my, on my late wife's account after she passed away. And then when she moved out of the, well, actually, when I had her removed from the home, the police made her leave the I believe they made her leave the iPad there because it was technically still in, under my control because of the, the account was was technically mine and my late wife's Verizon account. And then, and you valued those at thirteen hundred dollars, 
something like that. I know the, they, I, they, I, they, I know the got, yeah the one that I used for work was more of a more of expensive iPad because it had more I guess gigabytes and held more information on it than, than the other one because I had to have a, a bigger iPad for the one for work. And it was there when you got displaced from the home. It was, sir. yes, sir. And it, it wasn't there when you got your own back. It was not. Okay. Late wife's cell phone. Can you describe what that is to the court? Uh, it was an iPhone with a uh, white plastic case on it that uh, held all of her personal information on it from from over the years. Uh, you know, all of her pictures from me and her, her grandkids, everything. It had all, all of her, you know, personal documents up for work, her work emails on there, uh, her personal emails on there. Uh, it's got probably company information from uh, the company she worked for, uh, other companies' information on it. You know, it's got all my business information. It's got my QuickBooks on it. Uh, so, you know, it's that phone. It's got a lot of personal information to, to a lot of other companies and people tied on to it. And it was there when you got displaced from your home? Yes, sir, it was. And it was not there when you got your home back? It was not, sir. And you think this is a fair and accurate valuation of it? Yes, sir. What about the spare iPhone Sydney used? Was it uh, there when you... The day the day I, the day I had Sydney removed from, from the police, I mean, the day I had, I had, I had the police remove Sydney from the home, uh, the phone, the police told her she left the phone there, uh, and I had the phone cut back on under another number that I would use it just as a spare phone to keep around the house. And it was there when you got displaced from the home? It was there because I actually that night I tried to get the phone that night and the White Bluff police officer would not let me remove that phone from the home because he said, well, we don't know who it belongs. I said, well, sir, it's in my name under my late wife's account. And he would not let me remove the phone from the home that night. And it's not there when you got your home? That was not. It was a fair and accurate value of that $800? Yes, sir. I'll make a quick somehow this photograph has gotten in there but what is this a picture of that was one of the bags of, of my uh brand new clothes that we that she had bought, uh, bagged up and somebody had taken defecate on top of them when we tore the bag open you can see it been on there and then it started growing like, like mold over the top of it so your testimony today is that's the feces on your clothes and that's how you found it when you got your home back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That was, and that's when it goes back to where I told you some of the stuff had fell behind the dresser and I scared the dresser out. Your item 12 is a deodorant. There was $40 each. You got body wash, uh, $50 each. You had five and two of those respectively. Were they there when you left your a home? A lot of it. No, a lot of them was gone because I, I always buy a bunch of those ahead. Oh, hear me now. When you got displaced from your home, were they there? Yes, sir, they was. Yeah. And when you got your home back, were they no, there? No, sir, that was not. Just a fair and accurate depiction of what you you say the value of these things are? Somewhere about a banner, yes, sir, because I tried to pull the receipts back offline. All right. All right. Let me interrupt you. We're going to take a short recess. We'll be in recess for about 15 minutes. All rise.